All right. Okay, guys. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's Saturday morning. It's 8 a.m. Central Time, 9 a.m. East Coast Time, uh, 7 a.m. Mountain Time, and uh, 6 a.m. California Time, Pacific Time, right? And I want to welcome everybody to Caliber Corner episode number 139, if I'm not mistaken. And today we are going to talk Milserp rifles. We're going to spend some money today. We're going to find a nice deal on a Milserp rifle or check the prices and see what's out there. Um, Many times we just focus on one particular rifle for an episode of Caliber Corner. And today I got a bunch of tabs open of cool Millsurp rifles. I'm kind of curious about the prices and then also maybe destroy some of the myths about ammunition. There's a lot of people that won't buy certain rifles because they think that they can't get ammo for it. And there's going to be a legitimate argument for some rifles on that. But uh, really, I think you're going to find out that ammunition, thanks to the internet, is much more plentiful than you realize. So before we get into that discussion and get into a little bit on 22 short, which is going to be our uh, our little caliber spot spotlight for the week. Uh, we're going to go and let everybody introduce themselves. So again, this is Caliber Corner. Welcome to the show. Defense Dad, what's going on? We got another fellow in Nebraska in the house. This is your first episode of Caliber Corner, isn't it? It is. Thanks for the invite. It's pretty intense, isn't it? Are you nervous? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> hey, man, after doing that collab video, how could you be nervous, right? Yeah. Yeah, I embarrassed myself in front of what thirty thousand people. That's pretty cool. I don't embarrass yourself. Don't worry. It was fun. It was. We got a part <laughs> two. We got a part two now that's been thrown down. So we're gonna have a, everybody watching. If you haven't watched the collab video, check out Sandhill Shooter channel and check out Defense Dad's channel and um, look at the little collab video that we did. We had a, a little shooting challenge that we did just for fun. And uh, Sandhills has dropped the gauntlet. There's a part two now that we have to do. So this could be interesting. So Defense Dad, you got yourself a channel on YouTube. What kind of content do you feature? You know, I'm I'm kind of newer to this game, so my my channel's really for other new gun owners or um, people buying their first gun, uh, just to maybe help them learn from some of the mistakes that others do and maybe save them some money. Uh, what to look for in in the first gun and and what may be be beneficial to you. Uh, so just just trying to help other people out. You know, and, and unfortunately, defense dad, as somebody who's kind of new to the firearms game, as you are, and, and no offense on that, but unfortunately, you've kind of missed the the great deals on Milser, you know, rifles and the and the inexpensive Mosins. And but there's still some good deals that are out there. But unfortunately, you know, if anybody I and mean, just like me, I, I I hadn't bought a Milser rifle in 20 years before I purchased my Mosin. And I mean, you know, prices on those things have gone up. So we've got about 15 different rifles we'll talk about today uh, just to kind of get through. Um, but anyway, so Defense Dad, you got questions? Man, just go ahead and ask them, okay? Absolutely. Cool, cool. All right, moving on. We've also got AWAG 1000. AWAG, what's up, man? Howdy. How, you, How doing? you doing? Thanks for the invite. I'm doing good. Doing good. Right. Thanks for inviting me. So AWAG is kind of our resident uh, youngin' and uh, rifle expert, which is why it's good to have him on the show. And he's been with us since like episode three of Caliber Corner. I don't know. He was like yeah. 14 when he joined us. I don't even know if it was yeah. legal for him being on the panel, but, you know, it's fine now. Statutory limitations, so we're good. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, nah, I'm just kidding. So AWAG, quick update. How's the Super doing, man? Uh, it's doing good. I just ordered a bunch of parts for it. I should hopefully within the next two or three weeks be uh, throwing her back together. So by the time it retires, you should have it all done, right? Uh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Cool, cool, cool. And AWAG's also a uh, a little uh, a little car fan, a little car fanatic, right? Yeah. I'm a, I'm a car person before I'm a gun person. So that should tell you something uh, by how much guns I like. All right, all right, all right. I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. But that's okay because we need your expertise today anyway. So we're going to let that slide. So, All right. Also joining us, we got a little Black Cat Outdoors. Black Cat, what's going on, brother? Oh, not much. Trying to get done with work here at some point. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's not too loud. No, no, we're good. We're good. You got yourself a channel on YouTube, don't you? Ah, uh, little one. It's not quite as big as yours, you know. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's uh, not. Yeah, about I have a little channel. Message, man. Man. It's about the message. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug. Uh, I'm gonna use mine to plug uh, the Pennsylvania rally, though. That's coming up. That's my last video. I probably have. At the very top of my channel, mm -hmm. if anybody's from PA and wants to know what's going on, there's a, that's a little video on it right there. That the rally in PA is still going on Monday at 10 a.m. So if people want to come out, we're still going to have people there. We're still going to have speakers there. This Monday, right? This Monday, yep. Okay. I have a video I put out yesterday on it, just a little kind of five or six minute live stream explaining kind of the brief of what's going on, the brief version of what was going on with it. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool, man. Well, I'm glad to have oh, you here. Man. I think this is the second week. You're, you were with us last week, too, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. You're on yeah. Saturday mornings. I can jump back in now because I'm usually working. But mm-hmm. my job entails me sitting on my butt and driving down the road. So hey, that's right. I would like to plug, too. I have a, uh, a motion they got Mix Master for sale for $700 if anybody's interested. Yeah, don't try and lowball me. I know exactly what I have. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. And also joining us, we got a little squib. Squib load. What's up, man? Good morning. I uh, apologize for any background noise. I have neighbors all around. I'm outside on the front deck actually enjoying nice weather. I have neighbors yeah. around constantly mow their lawn. And mm-hmm. like the guy across the street, I think he mows it three times a week. It doesn't grow that fast. So. Oh, I do too. No, it does. Well, in Nebraska, it does. You have to. Oh, otherwise, whatever, it's Travis. Ass, you're so. that guy. I mean, dude, really, dude. It it's like an inch a day. It is, and the problem is, there's a lot of peer pressure that you feel because your neighbors are mowing, and you're like, okay, I don't really need to, but it's a nice evening. They're already making noise. I'm gonna get the mower out anyway. That's what people do around here. It's weird. It's weird. Okay, yeah. but here's the thing. I'm sitting on the front deck trying to enjoy some coffee in the morning. I got to with the lawnmower. Middle of the day, I may be trying to jump onto a live show, lawnmower. It's like six hours. Afternoon, I got the windows open, (laughs) want some fresh air in, trying to watch some TV, maybe watch some sports or something, lawnmower. Yeah. So when they're all done mowing their lawn and the sun's about to set and they're all sitting watching there, that's when I fire up my weed whip and make as much, like, take this, you. You know what you should do? You know what you should do? Take take the muffler off the mower just just once, just a small. Oh, just, just, I can. I don't do know that. if it's going to hurt your carburetor with like the exhaust valves, but just take the take the muffler off. Put your ear pro on. La 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 la. la. You know, just burr. dude. You imagine how loud that would be? That would sound I like mean, a freaking. Yeah, I'm just imagining just, how much fun that would be because my mowers are loud anyway. But you take the muffler off that monster. So I'm using. Uh, I'm water cooling my phone because we're on the duck. It has a tendency to overheat my phone and shut off. So I'm mm-hmm. trying the old put the bottled water behind the phone to keep it cool trick. We'll see how well that works. If I drop out, I'll come back. You should get a cold pack and put a washcloth on top of it and just sit it on top of there. Yeah, I, I should. Now I've got a hiking phone, so it's water resistant. So I should be able to get it as wet as I want and it, it won't have issues like that Samsung did. But uh, this is a subject that uh, I'm very fond of. I'm, I'm a Millsurp guy. I've been buying Millsurp rifles uh, for, for 20 years now. And, you know, at first it was the cool military factor. And then I started to look at the history. And with Millsurps, you can accessorize them and try to get the original sling and try to get the original combination tool and try to get the original yeah. bayonet and the original scabbard and the original frog. and Clean kit. And- Oh, yeah. I mean, all of it. So it can turn into an adventure trying to get original stuff for them. Uh, and and parts are available for a lot of Millsurps, but sometimes just like the Millsurps, that dries up. So you've got to be – it depends on what you want. A lot of guys just say, I want a cheap rifle that is military and is cool. And they may never get into historical things, so they don't care if they have a bayonet for it or yeah. if it has a sling or, or – uh, you know, but some people bubba up these military surplus rifles. So if you're looking to get it just because you want a cheap gun, bubba's fine. But if you want something that's historically accurate, you got to kind of do some research and know what to look for because people will sell you a mismatched rifle, but they want matching part price for it. And it's, it's something to be aware of. And the thing about the uh, sporterized rifles, the bubba up rifles, I mean, if you look, a lot of these models, they're bringing – a ton more money than maybe they really should because you're not getting the original gun anymore. It's been cut up and chopped up and the barrel's been cut down and it's in a non original stock. And there's some of these sporterized models are bringing a premium price, especially if it wasn't a factory sporter. It's amazing what I'm thinking of like some of the SKSs and stuff. It's like, they're asking more for a sporterized SKS with just maybe some basic parts on it versus an original that's still packed in cosplaying that we can get from like classic firearms. And see, when I'm talking to somebody at a gun show or something like that, and they've got the sporterized Arasaka or whatever, I'm like, no, yeah. I want something original. I want that Radley dust cover. I want the chrysanthemum. You know, I want and 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 they're but but 
this one is all drilled and tapped and all that. That's good and fine if I want to use this as my deer rifle. And there, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's what a lot of these guys did with guns that they brought back. They just turned them into their hunting rifle. But from a historic, I, I get them for a historical. I like to shoot them. I don't want to just have it and not be able to shoot it. But I, I like to get them from a historical standpoint. And some gun dealers or some people that are selling their collections don't get that. So I'll, I'll usually, uh, if I have one sporterized rifle, it was factory sporterized. And I, I didn't want it for about a year. And finally I said, ah, I'll take it. It's actually a nice shooting rifle. But I wouldn't have done that to the rifle. I would have left it in its original configuration. Mm -hmm. But since it's already been done up, yeah, but I wasn't. I wasn't going to pay original prices for it. Yeah. Even though it's got better sights and a better stock and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it's just, it's something to consider. It just depends on what, what your reasoning is for having a mill serve. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And last but not least joining us, we've got the other fellow in Nebraska with us today, Sandhill Shooter. Sandhills, how's it going, man? Hi, my name is John and I'm a Nebraskan. Yeah. Welcome to the club. <laughs> I mowed my lawn last night so mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have to do it today. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's D Day. So if it you is. or probably unlikely anybody listening to me right now was there, but if you know somebody that was there or somebody that fought in that war, then uh, you need to show them how much you appreciate the fact that we're speaking English right now and not German. Uh, I love that. So it was the greatest generation. Like, they called them that for a reason. Today was called the longest day for a reason do some research and find out what kind of hell those fellas charged into willingly just to keep us a free nation and a free world. So it was a, it was a, a bad thing that turned out for the best. Mm. And I uh, very much appreciate everybody that had a hand in that. So whatever I do on my channel doesn't mean much uh, compared to what those fellas did. Oh yeah. Any service mem members for that matter. But yeah, definitely today is a very important anniversary. All right, uh, quick reminder that today's episode is brought to you courtesy of SS Pond in Lexington, Nebraska. Take the exit to Lexington, Nebraska off Interstate 80. SS Pond is just off to the right. Stop in there, say hello to Stan. Tell him the Travis P11 sent you. Pick up a firearm, go home happy. SS Pond will take care of your firearms needs. Let's see who's joining us this morning. There's already a lot of comments rolling through over on the uh, YouTube chat side. So we got Jason Stewart joining in. Uh, Tacos and French Fries says, most of my mill serves are original, except for one, one Mosin that was done well. Yeah, I've got two Mosin Nagants. One of them is Numbers Matching Hex, which is my baby that's sitting right behind me. Uh, Non-counterboard. I don't think it's even been armory refinished. It's beautiful. And then I've got one that's a numbers, non-numbers matching. It's been to hell and back, 1943. Just awesome, awesome model. Nice patina to it. Um, I might show that one off in a video too, but that one was only 200 bucks. And I, that was recently when I bought it, which is a high price, but um, let's see, Carolina EDC Reviews is out there, Gun Loving Grandpa is joining us, Jason Stewart is out there, 10X Shooters, Fluffy 10mm Jeep Guy says, I finally got my X-Tar EP9 the other day, it's nice, I haven't shot it yet. Yeah, those are very cool, I watched the uh, Honest Outlaws Reviews video, Honest Outlaw Reviews videos, uh, on, video on that X-Tar EP9, and that looks like a really cool little PCC. Or I guess you could say just small firearms pistol, right? Uh, 10X Shooters out there, tacos and french fries. Yoder, Texas says, what in the world am I doing up this early? I must be ill. Hi, Travis P11. Good morning, Yoder. Good morning. Ronald Robertson says, I bought my 9130 about 12 years ago at 130 bucks. Ronald, so did I. The hex I got behind me, I picked up at Cabela's for like 127 It was weird. They had them on sale one weekend. They had a couple crates of them that showed up, and I requested a hex receiver and got one, so I got lucky. Tacos and French Fries says, my next Milser purchase is a Garand rifle. You can pronounce it Garand. I pronounce it Garand. According to Forgotten Weapons, that was the dying request of the designer of the rifle, is that everybody knows his last name was pronounced Garand. Uh, so that's if you call it a grand, it's a grand or whatever. It's no big deal to me. But Mr. DJ Raz says mega shout outs. Mega shout outs to you too, buddy. Lockjaw's out there too, joining us today. Net Flutter's out there. Mm, anybody else? South Parx is also watching. Whew, man, we got a whole world of rifles to talk about. I'm just going to go ahead and go through these one at a time. And you guys can share any information you might know about them. You might own one of these. Uh, hey, real quick, Ronald Robertson says, my dad was in the 194th or 197th Glider Infantry, 17th Airborne Division in World War II as a scout. That's some interesting stuff, man. Very cool. Very cool. 
Uh, the first rifle I want to talk about today is the Craig Jorgensen. Craig Jorgensen. Does anybody on the panel have one of these things? The Craig Jorgensen. Not yet. Not yet. All right. So what I'm going to do is just just show the model off real quick. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but I just want to give just a real quick little history on uh, each model we're going to talk about. So just real quick, it says the Krag Jorgensen is a repeating bolt action rifle designed by the by a couple Norwegians, Ole Herman, Johannes Krag, and Eric Jorgensen in the late 19th century. It was adopted as a standard arm by Denmark, the United States, and Norway. About 300 were delivered to Boer forces of the South African Republic. A distinctive feature of the Krag Jorgensen action is the magazine. While many other rifles of this era use an integral box magazine loaded by a charger or stripper clip, the magazine of the Krag Jorgensen is integral with the receiver featuring an opening on the right side with the hinge cover instead of a charger single cartridges are inserted through the side opening and are pushed up around and into the action by spring follower so squib load what is it about this rifle that just fascinates you let's just look at the design here what is it that's so cool and what do you what do you know about them squib so i believe this was the first uh smokeless centerfire rifle that we adopted in large quantities okay. uh the lee navy might have been the first uh first smokeless rifle i can't remember if that was black powder or not but in in at your standard arm large quantities we were getting the craig jorgensen and i believe that the uh the norwegian or the danish was chambered in something different and then we had the the 3040 craig and for, for me, the, the, the side load is kind of cool. The history of it's kind of cool. This is a turn of century gun. There were a lot of these things available uh, at the start of World War I. Uh, and as far as I know, they were employed in World War I. To what extent, I'm, I'm not familiar with. But these, these things, I mean, it was one of those, we got a whole bunch of these. What are we going to do? They were drill rifles for people in training, stuff like that, because they needed the newer stuff on the front lines. Uh, these things went overseas for smaller conflicts. They were, you know, used on board ship. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're all over the place. And historically it's just, it's another piece of history, whether you want to get an American one or whether you want to get a Norwegian one. I don't know if you can, I don't know if I've seen any Danish ones for sale, but uh, as a reloader, it'd be kind of cool to, to try to replicate a military uh, style load for 3040 craig as well so that's another thing about mill serps it, it kind of ties in with the reloading in some cases it's more practical to reload because it's the, you can get the ammunition cheaper and more plentiful in other cases it's just part of that whole history you know kind of getting your hands on with, with the history I was going to talk about, yeah, the chamberings. I'm seeing three over here. Now, I'm getting everything off of Wikipedia, and I'm going to be honest. I mean, I, you don't want to make Wikipedia your only source, but from what I see for the most part when I look up gun information, from what I know, it appears to be true. It doesn't mean there can be errors in anything we're going to talk about. But with that Craig Jorgensen, they're talking about production numbers of in excess of 750,000. Now, cartridges, I got the 8 by 58 r Danish Craig round, the 3040 Craig round, and the 6.5 by 55 millimeter Swedish? Yeah, that sounds correct. Okay, so the ammo, what would be the most common ammo that we could look for? Because I'm going to go over to ammo so you can just see if we the, can find the ammo. 30, 40 the 3040 30, 40 Craig. The 3040 Craig and then the 6.5 Swedish. But uh, that other one there, that, that 8 millimeter by 58? Yeah. Yeah, you're going to have to hand load that, I think. 8 millimeter, 8 millimeter R, Danish Crag. So you really got to be have a hard time even finding brass for 8 millimeter. Yeah, so you, you got to reform it, right? I yeah. believe so. I don't know if there's any place in the U.S. to get even commercial brass for that one. You have to try. I, there might be a company or two that does like a limited run every once in a while, but I've never seen that anywhere, not, the, not even the brass for it. 3040 Craig and 65 by 55, most companies load, have factory loads for those. Now they're going to be more modern loads, but yeah, I, I know BPU, Winchester, Remington, I think they all load 3040 Craig. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Common one. Right now on AmmoSeek, uh, Hornady does, you can get a 200-round case for a buck 16 a round. Uh, Hornady custom load, 180-grain spire point. So you can get, I mean, the nice thing is you might be like, well, I don't want to get that. I can't find ammo for it. You might have to go online, but you can buy it. Heck, they got, there's a, a Hornady 
let's see, you can get a 20 round box at a, okay, so a dollar 16 around is as cheap as you're going to get the ammo for it. And then it definitely starts to go up the price. You know, there's, there's, um, Hornady seems to be, okay, Remington does load uh, 30, 40 Crag also. So you've got a couple. There's also HSM. I'm not sure if that's also Hornady or not, but it might be Hornady Small Munitions possibly. But, um, no, Game King. Yeah, there's you got a lot of options out there for ammo. So what are these things running in your neck of the woods? Have you guys seen any for sale locally that's, uh, that seems to be a good deal at all? Have you guys ever seen these at gun shows and stuff? What are these going for? And if you I've have seen to worry about gun shows, but I can't remember what the last one was going for. I know they're not cheap. I have only seen one unmolested one. I mean, if you want, you want a sporterized one for a shooter. Around me, they go like three fifty to four hundred bucks. The unmolested ones around here go for big money because they're most of those were sold off back when our government used to sell off surplus rifles. And most of them were turned into sporters. So an unmolested one around here goes for about 800 bucks. I know that. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking them up right now. Hey, you guys will have to let me know when people jump in. Um, here we go. Okay, so Sand Hills, it looks like uh, we're full right now, but I did let in Calaveras. So, Sandy, we'll get you back in when we can here. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Actually, let's go ahead and so AYG said he'll be back in 10. So we're going to go ahead and bring Sandhills back in real quick. Um, I'm looking right now at these Craig Jorgensen's for sale over on Gunbroker. And I'm finding a Springfield manufacturer, 1898 and 3040 Craig for $1599. Um, I'll find another one for $2,000. Uh, you get a sporter, like you got sporters I'm seeing are anywhere from like $300 to $800. So if a person wants one, I mean, I guess you're just going to be limited by your budget if you decide you want to go the sporterized round or if you want to go the original style. I mean, starting bid on these is 900 bucks. Here's the thing I want to tell you guys about Milserp right now. I don't think I've ever – you guys ever seen a Milserp rifle go down in price, like, significantly? No, no. On it. I mean, these are these are good investments. Nope. You know, I would rather be investing in these and buying these and maybe shooting them and enjoying them once in a while, as long as they're safe to shoot. Safe to shoot. Um you know, make sure you get it checked out or make sure you know that it doesn't have any issues before you take it to the range the first time. But I mean, I think that they're a good investment for the money. And if you're kind of not really sure what you want to buy for your next firearm, consider a Milserp if you don't have one, because you're not going to lose money on it if you'd ever have to sell it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. What, do you think a person should go the sporterized route or should you go the the standard layout route? If you had the money, which way would you guys go? Would you rather have a sporter just to have something a little bit more compact or maybe to have something... I don't know, something you can put a nice optic on, or what do you guys think about that? I think it depends what you're using it for. If uh, you want it for an investment gun, uh, then having one that's in original condition is probably going to be better off. Yeah. If you want something that's just going to be a shooter that you can uh, throw an optic on or not, use as a uh, – one of the things I want a, a Milsurp for is, you know, Decently hard hitting iron sight, you know, a beater rifle that I can have as a backup deer camp gun, which to me at that point, I wouldn't care if it's a sporter or an original as long as it's still shot true. Okay. But it really depends on what you're looking for. Yeah. I mean, I'm checking these out. They're, they're neat looking. I mean, the sporters, I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you. They look, they look cool. I'm just gonna, I mean, that would just be, that'd make a fun little brush gun. You know, look at that thing, man. That one's, uh, oh God, buy it now for 1850. And like I was saying, it could be a sporter. And people still want to ask the same price as an unmolested original, you know? Okay, I mean, so, yeah, well, if you're looking at Gun Broker, though, you got to remember, I would look at completed auctions on Gun Broker, not what some of these people are asking stuff that they're never going to get. Okay, for. ask it. I'm looking at current bid prices, though, too. I mean, I'm just saying that. And Gun Broker is, in my opinion, it is going to be high. You're going to pay a premium because it's there. There's a convenience factor. There's fees that people have to pay, so people are trying to make up that difference. But honestly, without having a season of gun shows really out here in Nebraska, you know, a person doesn't have a lot of options to try to just find one you can handle and look at. You yeah, know, see, that's the reality of it. So and that's and that's a limitation that you know you've got to work within. So the gun bro like out here, this is the thing. Everybody's like, go to Wanamaker, go to Wanamaker, dude. Gun shows in Michigan, I can find dang near any gun in existence. In some cases, multiples. 
it's like going to a gun museum. So I, I, I don't understand the whole go to Wanamaker because they've got every gun you could ever possibly see. And well, I don't know, okay, I could, okay. But so, if you live in a state that they don't have that sort of thing, then it's going to be the same thing as going to Wanamaker or going to a gun broker. It just depends. It, it really just depends on your location, right? Here's the thing about Wanamaker Squibb. It's not that they don't have a Craig Jorgensen. It's that they have 300 Craig Jorgensons. It's not that they have a, a yeah, Luger. But they have, they have 300 Lugers. I mean, that's, I guess the selection is right, something but that I like, but yeah. I'm not going to Podunk. They got 12 tables and they got one Craig and one Luger gun show. I'm going to a regular gun show and they're going to have a dozen Craigs and 60 okay. Lugers and, yeah, you know, okay. 20 Garands and 100,000 sure. Arasakas. <laughs> and, you know, so and I would rather kind of buy it in person uh, from a, a, a dealer at a gun show or at some of the gun stores that actually carry mill surfs, not the pawn shops, but the there are some gun stores here that carry mill surfs. Uh, and, and I don't mean the ones that are bought in bulk. I mean, somebody actually traded it for something else. And this is a decent mill surf or buy it from another private owner, in my experience. Somebody else, you know, you, if you use gun broker and you've had good results, then, you know, go with it. Or if you just don't have that sort of thing and you don't want to drive to Wanamaker, you know, go with it. But it, it's a good rule of thumb. But like what, what Black has said, yeah, they're asking prices online that I don't care about their fees and stuff like that. That's not my problem. They're asking prices that I wouldn't pay because I, I can get a better deal at the gun show. Yeah, and you know, you know and, there's, and there might be people that just don't have those options. I don't disagree with you at all. I have purchased off a gun broker, but it's always been new, and the prices have always been amazing. But when it comes to Millsurp, no, I've never purchased Millsurp off a gun broker. I'd rather handle the rifle personally, make sure there's absolutely nothing wrong with it that's not shown in the pictures. You know, pitting in the inside the chamber, or maybe a crack in the stock, or you know, yeah, the man, you can guns. really drop some serious cash on these guys. Certain guns now, like. Craig was fairly low pressure, but some of those rifles you really want to check out fairly well. I mean, you could end up with something that won't even head space, especially if you're looking at things like Garands. There are a lot of feeder Garands out there, and they're trying to ask the same money that you'll pay for a good Garand. And I mean, they, you're, the head spacing's all off. They're barely safe to shoot anymore. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you, you, there's just stuff that you can look for. I mean, when I'm shopping in for Millsurf rifles at a gun show, I'm sticking a bore light down there, checking the rifling, checking the chamber out. I mean, it, it's one of those things. I don't really have a case gauge for a lot of them other than three. I do have a 303 Brent go no go gauge I can use because I used to collect Enfield. So I, I actually do have one of those to check the spacing on those. But yeah. man, it's one of those things that. I, I just don't like ordering no serve stuff online without being able to kind of verify what they're claiming, you know? That's man, and that's and that's also one of the reasons why I've never done like any of the classic firearms when they show off like a case of the Beretta ninety two Italian police pistols that are decommissioned or whatever. You know, like I have never wanted to buy one because you read the reviews and somebody gets an awesome one and somebody gets one that's garbage and they paid the same amount of money or people pay for the hand and I'm not knocking classic okay i bought a lot of guns from classic farms but like you pay that extra money for hand select where you're getting the best out of 10 out of those 10 you're not necessarily getting the best one out of the entire crate you know and so i ah man i if you can buy one locally do and you know maybe maybe you know if you talk to your local gun store owner they might know somebody that has one or they might have one in their collection um because, yeah, I mean, I'm looking at if I'm going to drop $2,500 on a Craig Jorgensen, I want to handle the thing. I want to get it tested, make sure it's going to be something I could enjoy because I'm buying it to enjoy and shoot it, you know? Um, I don't know. You got a very good point about that, Black Hat. I, I, oh, and we're not saying don't buy them online, but if you can get one local, do unless somebody can verify and they've got a return policy on it where you can send it back and get your money back on it. Because this seems to be, and this is kind of one of the higher end, you know, pistols or rifles that we're going to be talking about today because – that, well, not the only one, but twenty five, twenty six hundred dollars is is a decent amount of change. Here's the thing about classic firearms: they get big lots of guns that were bought from a private owner or released from an arsenal. So when they get in there, now I'm not saying from time to time they don't have small batches. They'll do. They'll get a small collection and they've got three or four guns and they're gone so fast it isn't even bother worth re reading the email. But like when they had the uh, the M thirty nines. Uh, from Finland, they had nine tractor trailer loads of these things, nine, 
right? So at the time you could pick up an M39 real fast, but when they finally ran out of these things, the prices went way up. They'll get these batches of handguns in. And then when they're all sold out, the prices will go up. Then they'll oh, yeah. miraculously get another batch. The prices will come down. And when you buy online during those times, that's when you can get a good deal after they're done. And you may go, well, they've gotten Toka revs in nine times. They'll, they'll get another batch of Toka revs. Then they don't. And you're going, oh man, I missed the mm-hmm. ship. The, the other thing is classic firearms used to be able to just go on their website, look around, buy something. They shipped it to you. No problem. Now they put it out there and within seconds of it going on, it's gone. They, they, they figured out at some point, if we just tell people at noon on Friday, we're going to have these things up for sale by 1201, we'll sell all 5,000 of them. And they do. And back before that, they were actually a nice website to go to because you could go, I want a car 98K and I don't want to have to drive to the gun show and you just go on classic and order a car 98K. Well, now you can't do that because people caught on and now they just snatch them up, snatch them up. So in some cases, it's really frustrating. So if you've ever gotten that one bad gun from classic, or you, you're sitting there and at 11.59, you've got your cart and you're ready to end at 12, 12 noon. It, what do you mean out of stock? It, it'll leave a bad taste in your mouth. But for lower prices, that's what they're good for. When these things come in in batches, it's great. But when those batches dry up, you can't sit there and twiddle your thumbs and go, I'll just wait yeah. for the next batch because it may not come. Here's a great example. The uh, the Makarovs, they were what, 179, 179. And now that they're basic, and you know, they might pop up from time to time. I said, well, I saw them on JNG sales last week. If you just go off of what the market price is, what you're seeing in gun shows and what you're seeing on some of these uh, gun websites, they're $350, $400 guns now for just a basic Makarov for Bulgarian Mac or whatever. Um, so yeah, you need to get the next one that I see going up in price is going to be the Star BMs. Those were what, $189 when they kind of bottomed out. And I guarantee those will be 300, 350 by next year. Like you said, the lots dry up. And it does kind of bug me that, yeah, some of these places will advertise it. Low volume of these. This is all we got. And they're selling them for a premium. And then the price just slowly starts to climb up. And I think, unfortunately, that has a lot to do with maybe the overall market price. What you see these things being advertised at online can also affect you locally. Plus, you know, Classic has their, uh, I'm not bashing Classic Farms. They've got their YouTube channel. They show those guns off. And the first comments you see down below is, oh, sold out. Oh, they're gone. Oh, they're out of here. You know. And so, I mean, yeah, it's it's really hard to get these things. And also, here's the other thing about all these Millstrip guns we're talking about. Really spend some time and do the research because you might be, you might want a particular variant that's going to be more rare or it's going to be worth more more money. Like I'm thinking of some of these Finnish Nagants, uh, some of the Finnish capture Nagants and how they do bring almost double or triple what a, what a low-end Mosin is going to bring. So, yeah, Daniel, I agree with you too. I do have one coming, Daniel Pfeiffer. I do have a Makarov coming. But um, yeah, so I mean, it. Uh, you really need to do your research, especially when you get into Mosins, because you might be paying a premium for something that's just kind of a, a, a just a bargain basement, basic standard issue Mosin, and they might want four hundred dollars for it. When you can look around and maybe get it for three hundred elsewhere, when there's absolutely nothing particular special about that model. So do your research on these uh, mill strips before you buy them. You know, numbers matching is always important. Does it have the original bayonet with it? Maybe, maybe not. You know, that's also a pretty big deal. So, Squib, a question about this Craig Jorgensen, this uh, 3040 Craig. What is that comparable to in terms of power? Because it says it says 30 Army when you look up the, the ammunition on Ammo Seek. It says 3040 Craig, and then it says 0. .30 Army in parentheses. What do we know about the round? Uh, unfortunately, I can't remember as much as I used to know. So as far as something comparable, I'm not quite sure but i don't believe it's the same 30 caliber bullet that you'd use in 30 out 6 308 300 blackout it's it's a i don't think it's the same uh diameter bullet but uh it's been a while since i've read up on the the craig jorgensen's uh there was a time back in the 90s and the early 2000s you could pretty much buy anything anywhere for a really low price if you want a craig jorgensen you just said oh gun show saturday you go down there just grab craig yeah real cheap 200 bucks 400 bucks whatever and just and, you know, at that time I was kind of researching some stuff and other times I, I wasn't, you know, and I passed. I can't believe how many mill serps I've passed on that today you just can't find or that are double, triple, quadruple in price. And I'm like kicking myself that I should have. Uh, so there was a time where I was reading uh, about Craig Jorgensen's, but honestly, I don't remember everything. And that that ship has sailed for now. At some point, I may go back and get one. I'd like to. 
But at the time, I was researching the differences between the Norwegian and the U.S. one Mm -hmm. and trying to make up my mind, which one do I want to get? Well, the U.S. is a lot more common and 30, 40. And at the time, I wasn't reloading either or whatnot. But uh, yeah, I I honestly, Travis, I don't remember too much about it. I I got some ballistic numbers here. We'll we'll go from one of the extreme to the other. So if you go with the 100 grain soft point, we're looking at a velocity of 2,898 feet per second. And an energy of 1,865 foot pounds. So that's a that's a pretty stout round. I mean, that especially if you really want to consider something as like a multi-purpose rifle, maybe you want to make it your hunting rifle. Maybe you want to keep it as kind of your defend the property rifle. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, yeah, modern farms, you could say that they're they're a little more efficient than these mill serps, but uh 200 grain round nose ball, we're looking at 1,974 feet per second and 1,731 foot pounds of energy. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. So we're talking about a pretty, a really stout round. Two hundred. Go ahead. I was gonna say the two hundred green round nose. That's the original military loading for it. That's one of the reasons why we switched to the O the O three A three was the the bullets were. We wanted to go to a Spitzer type bullet like the eight millimeter round. And, uh, Craig at the time was loaded to a round nose bullet like that. So that's kind of your original military loading. But mm-hmm. with the amount of things that are sporterized, they load, like I say, you, you look at the ammo, they load all kinds of different stuff for them right now. So again, ammo is readily available for that. Depending on the specific chambering you go with for the Craig Jorgensen, ammo is out there if you want to get one. So, I mean, consider investing. If you can find a good deal on one or you find one available locally. Um, And we were talking about this before we started the podcast. Um, I'm also on MeWe. MeWe is a social networking site that, um, you know, it's it's got its hits and misses, you know, Tuesday nights at 9 o'clock. But MeWe is cool because that is a website that I belong to. And all of us I got booted out of Facebook gun groups went over to MeWe and we restarted up the exact same groups. In fact, I just sold a rifle yesterday morning going through MeWe. And you can post whatever you want. As long as you're not breaking the law, you can say and do whatever you want on MeWe. You can belong to whatever groups you want to. If you don't like a group, you don't have to belong to. So MeWe is a very good place to go to find local guns for sale. Now, obviously, you got to follow your local laws. And I always make sure the person's got their concealed carry permit and or their pistol purchase permit and a Nebraska driver's license to cover myself. And then I get their name so that I've got a record of who bought the gun in case anything would ever happen to it. So, um yeah, that's that's MeWe is a great place to go to find to find the the low, you know firearms for sale locally. I I recommend it. And if everything has to go through a dealer or there's no private sales allowed, you got to go through an FFL. Um, that's always been a good place for me to go. Now prices tend to be a little bit high, but if you negotiate with people on MeWe, you can generally get a good deal on a gun if you want one. I've sold more than I bought, but uh, that's a good place to go if you want to look for guns, especially without any gun shows going on right now, uh, or if you just you're tired of shopping online, you want to go local. Um, it's always an option. So, um, anything else about the Craig Jorgensen? Because we're going to move on to the next rifle. Going once, going twice. No. Okay. So, real quick, Daniel Pfeiffer says, "Kicking myself for not picking up a Makarov when they were cheaper." Yeah, three forty nine, two seventy nine, three hundred. That's kind of the asking price. You go over on GunBroker, they're four hundred dollars and up, uh, depending on if it's Russian or if it's Bulgarian. So. Yeah, Makarovs are definitely going up. The prices on Makarovs continue to rise. Okay, the next rifle that I have is the, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this one, guys, the Swiss K31, the Swiss Carabiner Model 1931. You guys ever had an interest in one of these before? I almost bought one of them um, a while back, but that was during the, uh, what was it? It was right after, like, Sandy Hook, where all the ammo for everything was non-existent. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm like hating myself for not picking one up now because they're absolutely great shooters. Talk about, I mean, fit and finish on them. They look, that bolt, it, can you, AY, can you kind of let us in on the action a little bit? What makes this unique compared to a lot of the uh, bolt actions that are out there? This is what's known as a straight pull uh, bolt, which uh-huh. is instead of, you know, the stereotypical lift up, pull back, push and push down. Uh, of your standard bolt actions. This is just straightforward, straight back. You know, that's how you run the action. So from a tactical standpoint, was it able to throw more lead downfield faster? Maybe that's the obvious answer. What was, is it more precise, more accurate? What is it about this design that, uh, yeah. It's just uh, a lot faster because you're doing two actions instead of four. True, true. 
And then how is the safety work on this thing? Do you turn it like clockwise or counterclockwise? Do you pull back almost like a Mosin and kind of pull off to the side or what do you, or no, that's your, okay. Your straight pull is going to be the side handle, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're, that's the, the, the little bigger keg. Uh, okay. Some of them are made out of metal. The later models are made out of metal. The earlier ones I think were made out of like Bakelite or something. Okay. And okay. they have those, uh, the ammunition chargers, like in that picture that you're showing there. Yeah. Yeah. Is this, like, is this this is how you so instead of the stripper clips this is what you would use yeah and they're actually pretty hard to find because i think they're made out of like some sort of like paper cardboard kind of deal oh wow i wonder if there's any aftermarket support for those because that'd be something interesting if somebody could maybe even 3d print something out of a thin plastic you know that would that actually would be a good idea i'll take the royalties on that if you guys ever market mm -hmm. it so um yeah i remember and i mean love it or hate it i, I do watch iraqi veterans 8888's channel and he did some really good videos on this uh it was when i was really just starting to kind of get into guns and i didn't didn't know much about them and uh he i mean watching these things shoot man they're just really cool rifles oh so they must have had some other sniper variants too is that what we're looking at here it seems to be so yeah. and i think they would be uh a three power scope on them. Okay. So, so I'm kind of curious. What is a okay now ammo? I've already looked at the ammo on this too. If you want ammo for it, it's the 7.5 by 55 millimeter Swiss round. You're looking at a velocity of 2,559 feet per second. I can't speak on the energy of it without actually opening up opening up the info on the round itself. I guess we can do that real quick. So 7.5 Swiss. If you want to go 130 grain, it's wow, 2,608 feet per second and 3,000, or no, 2,608 foot pounds of energy um, out of 130 grain round, 2,700 foot pounds of energy out of a 200 grain round, still traveling at 2,460 uh, feet per second. The ammo cost, if you want to buy it, is 74.2 cents a round if you want to go privy partisan. PPU ammo, which it, which is really good ammo. And that I've actually seen that just on the shelves locally, like in Cabela's and Shields and stuff like that. So ammunition is readily available for it, fourteen dollars and eighty four cents per box. And uh, looks like a lot of this is just ball ammo. Oh, there's some soft points out there too, so you could get it if you wanted to use one for hunting. Eighty nine cents around, ninety cents around. So the ammunition on this is not expensive from a reloading standpoint too. I mean the your bullets are going to be readily available. It's not something that uh, that you're going to have any kind of issue finding, but yeah, those are pretty cool. All right, so let's see what uh, let's see what a, a K31 sells for over here on Gunbroker. We're looking at 499, 449. They've always been a, a good deal in my opinion. I mean, they were maybe just slightly more than a Mosin at one point. What do you guys think about prices on this? Is this kind of what you've seen yeah. before, or what you've heard before? What do you guys yeah, know? This is this is right around the. Uh... The, the average price on one of these things. So like the one that I was looking at a while back was like 400 bucks, but that was a couple years ago. So, I mean, the, the prices have adjusted accordingly. So price high to low on the high end, 845 for a numbers matching. And they'll, and again, they get into the specifics about that run, that production run. What's the big deal about it? 599, 579. If I was going to get something, I, just kind of out of curiosity for the action itself, I'd probably consider buying one of these. But now here's the dilemma you run into. So you're shopping over on Gunbroker and you've got 100 of them for sale. I have no idea. 108 of them for sale. And it's like, okay, 549, I've got the photos, but do I want to, am I, do I want to take a chance on it? Um, I would imagine that you'd be buying yourself something that you could shoot, but there's never any guarantees, you know? Yeah. I mean, you're generally, kind of one. Yeah, generally you're, uh, your Swiss rifles, these things are so uh, well made that uh, I think a while back, like if you were to make one today, it would cost like $6,000 due to the, the machining tolerance quality. Oh, wow. And yeah, there's that bake light handle you were talking about. Yep. Now, is that that's an earlier model or is it later I, model that had bake light? No, I, I think this question, is the, the earlier models oh, of the, the okay. bake light. I okay. think. Uh, don't quote me on that. I'm not. Super up on the history of the uh, the K K31 series. Okay. So that's something interesting to consider. If you guys happen to see one at a gun show, you can definitely handle one and check one out. So we're looking at around $500 if you want to pick up a clean example. Uh, numbers matching. You know, and then there's a few more variants and stuff that they get into. So that's, that's another one that seems to pop up. Hey, if there's any, by the way, guys, I'm just running this off of one screen. If there's anybody that 
has any um, has any questions, make sure you let me know. I'm trying to catch the comments periodically. So private chat. Okay. All right. Uh, moving on. Uh, after this, we have the K98K. So let me go into a little screen share here. The Carabiner K98K manufactured by Mauser. Chambered in 792 by 57 Mauser. Any of you guys have a Mauser rifle at all on the panel? I got a um, M76 that uses the 8mm Mauser. And I almost bought a Yugo Mauser a while back, but then I found a bunch of rust on the barrel. Had to take it back. So let's talk about those Yugo Mausers for a little bit because they tend to be a little bit cheaper, if I'm not mistaken, from what I've seen for sale. Um, it, they, are they just essentially I – mean, are they – manufactured were they imported into yugoslavia because i've also seen argentinian mausers too where those were basically a german imported mauser that was used by the argentinian army right so what do we know about the history on these I, guys with the yugo mausers they were actually manufactured at the zastava plant so oh, okay okay they're actual yugoslavian mausers uh okay the yugoslavs area uh i have to say that now because yugoslavia no longer exists. yeah 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 we just want to uh, make sure we yeah they uh, received a bunch of uh, eight millimeter surplus. I forget from where, but they they got so much eight millimeter Mauser uh, ammo that they're just like, oh hey, you know what? We got all this ammo. Why not make guns for it? So they basically made the K ninety eight style Mausers, and I think they call it like the M forty eight. Okay. And then they made the um, the M seventy six. They also made a uh, an MG forty two style. Uh, uh, light machine gun. Okay. So they, okay. they definitely used a lot of eight millimeter Mauser. And then later on uh, into the Yugoslavian conflicts, Yugoslav civil civil war, they uh, went to their respective sides where it's, they used a little bit of five, four, five, not much. They went to seven, six, two by 51 NATO. They went to five, five, six. They went, you know, all the okay. calibers. So, the Yugoslav area was a big melting pot of just all of these different types of, you know, Eastern and Western weaponry. I've never fired one of these before. Like I've heard the, the action on them is basically legendary. Is it that smooth? Is it that, is it, is it overhyped or is it really the real deal? Um, the, the Mauser action. See with the Mauser action, it's, it's one of these, it's, it's strange compared to a Mosin. Yes. Um, they're much smoother, but, you know, you, you say, hey, how smooth is a Mauser action? And if you're talking to, like, a guy that does precision rifle shooting, modern precision rifles, it's it's as clunky as the Mosin, you know? Okay. Yeah, but the, the funny thing is most modern precision rifle actions are based on the Mauser action. Yes. Like, that was the first. I it's mean, kind of the granddaddy, that you know? Was the, that was the one that designed, I mean, most of your rifles, including the military's, Rifles from that era, you know, all your major Remington 700s, all that, basically copied the Mauser action. Yep. Yeah, basically every control round feed produced since, you know what, you know what, since 1900, I think it was, you know, basically it uses their design. Looking at the ammo, so just picking some, I'm just, again, I'm just trying to throw some facts and figures out there about the ammo. So we're looking at a 181 grain RWS DK bullet. Uh, 2,700 feet per second, 2,902 foot pounds of energy, but man, you can really get some stout loads, 198 yeah. grain, uh, 2,600 feet per second with 3,021 foot pounds of energy. Yeah. So that, man, that's a pretty potent round. It's, it's funny because most of your, uh, production, uh, eight millimeter Mauser is a lot softer than the military loads. Um, I think there was one point in there that they got, uh, an eight millimeter Mauser. I think it's really in the, um, in the Wikipedia article, they got like a 200 and something grain uh, bullet moving at like 2,800 feet per second. Hey, Travis, real quick. Yo, yeah. man, in the YouTube comments, Squib is saying that he has something to say, but I guess he's in the back room, so you can kick me back oh. there and bring him forward. Okay, okay. Well, Calvary, so I'm, you wait to boot you and bring him in? Yeah, that's true. Put me in the back room. Okay. Um, how do I – do I just click on the minus? <laughs> I think so. Okay, there we go. I, I've only used StreamYard a couple times, guys. I apologize. So, Squibby, there we go. Squib, I didn't know you disappeared, man. Yeah, I'm only using, dude, I'm, Squib, I, I'm only running a single screen. I apologize. I have no idea. So, we're going to be relying on everybody else to kind of keep me informed on who gets booted out and who wants in. So, it's all good. 
Um, now the ammo itself, let's just see what, what ammunition is going to run. So that's 792 by 57 Mauser. So AWAG, you're telling me that now, how is it? Can you still find the surplus ammo out there? Is it still readily available or should you not bother with it? In, in all honesty, I personally would not bother with it, but there is Romanian uh, eight millimeter Mauser surplus out there. Okay. Um, it's a little bit cheaper. Um, you're going to be hard pressed to find some actual German uh, surplus ammo. Okay. And there's, I think, think see, there's I some found some though. Yeah, yeah, I've got some Ethiopian eight millimeter Mauser surplus ammo, 196 yeah. green full metal jacket, lead core. 300 round battle pack, 300 rounds for 79.99. That's not bad. 26.7 cents per round. Yeah, it's it's not that bad. Are we are we looking at corrosive here too, or is that just kind of a Russian ammo thing? Is this I, gonna I, be... I think it might. If it's like the Ethiopian, Ethiopian or Egyptian, uh, they're probably going to be uh, corrosive. Uh huh. Yeah, the Egyptian rounds also is 29.9 cents around, so it's not an expensive round to get into it's not like you're gonna have to drop two or three dollars around i mean it's readily available um man there's and a lot of there's, there's like you that. go you go uh surplus since they ran out of their own surplus there they started making their own ammo so that there's i think they're brass cased uh, oh yeah the, there you go on the screen I'm, yeah I'm, I'm, your munitions non-corrosive yeah a little more expensive but if you want the brass and you can keep the keep the brass reloading 54.9 cents uh per round for a hundred and ninety-seven point five grain full metal jacket, that's not bad. Yeah, privy. Oh yeah, privy. Uh, PPU. I'm. I, just, I love their ammunition. Privy partisan makes great ammo. A little more of a premium price, but I, it's always shot well for me. Here's a two hundred grain match, full metal jacket, boat tail, seventy-four point two cents a round. Yeah, I use that. That's the ammo that I use in the uh, the M seventy six. And it, it, it prints pretty darn tight groups. I'm not going to lie. It's good ammo. Now, just looking at uh, at prices here, let me see what we can get. A so what would be what would be the more expensive Mauser AWAG that a person could buy? If you're going to buy what a German Mauser, what do we want to look for here for job? You're for? you're probably going to look for a German Mauser that has um, three. What is it's usually a three letter combination on the receiver. I forget what they call them. Is that JHV maybe? Would that be? I think I think that's one of okay. them. Whew. Okay, let me show you guys some prices here. You're gonna probably gonna need to take out some financing on this one. Yeah, you so. can you can spend a <laughs> ton of money. All right, so what are we looking at here? Let's just do some. I'm just having fun window shopping today. I can never actually afford any of these. So here's a sporter model for 3150. Uh, non sporter original, most expensive one that you can buy on Gun Broker, if I'm not mistaken, forty five hundred dollars for a sniper model. Nazi release sniper yep. model with the Sporsky scope on it. Yeah, that's that's about right. Um, one of my buddies has a um, uh, it's a Jaeger so he, edition or whatever you want to call it. My one of my buddies has a, uh, a bring back from World War II. His great grandfather brought it back, um, and it has all the the Nazi markings on it. Has the matching scabbard. It has the the bayonet has everything. It has all the little swastikas everywhere um, on it, and you know, it, it's it's a you know it's, it's a, the real deal. And I want to buy it so bad, but at the same time, I don't want to be that jerk. That, you know. Oh yeah. So sporters, you're looking at about half the price of. So here's a good example. Here's a another proof Nazi bring back. Right, three thousand ninety nine dollars versus fourteen ninety nine for a sporter. So, I mean, there's definitely, you know, a difference. You're going to pay double if it's a non-sporter model. $28.99. Trying to think of what the least expensive German Mauser Rare buy now. $1,100. $780. So, yeah, if you start to kind of get into the prices a little bit, let's let's go low to high. The problem is if I go low to high, then it's going to bring up, like, parts and accessories and stuff like that. So, so yeah. I was I was going to say, if you want a good quality Mauser, look for the Yugos or the uh, Swedish Mausers. Here's, okay, Yugo Mauser K98. Are they still called the K98 or not? Yugo Mauser? They're called the M48, I think. Okay, M48A. Okay, buy now, $500. There you go. Buy now, $625. Non-sporter. Uh, let's see, rebuilt, unissued, CNR, okay. So... If you just want a taste of the Mauser experience, but you don't want to drop all the change on it, 550 that's not bad. Now, that's buy now for 625 
Now this, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is numbers matching or not, but this one's a little bit rough, but still if a person wants to get into one. Yeah. And I know of a couple of people that are still using the, uh, the Yugo, just the Mauser action for their precision rifle build. There are companies okay. out there that will make a custom like rifle chassis for this. I mean, it doesn't even look like a, a Mauser anymore after it, but it's, you know, people use them. The actions are good. They're mm -hmm. strong. They can handle up to stupid amounts of pressure. There are people that are running, um, they're running like a 308 chamber, but they're running at, at like way hot uh, loads and it's still, still holding strong. So Squib, you've said you've got a, an M48. Squib, do you have any uh, any Mausers? Do you, anybody else on the panel have a Mauser? I don't have one, so you might be trying to find the mute button over there. So Squib, if you can, go ahead and chime in when you when you get a chance. Okay, I got you in the uh, the chat here. Oh, there's Black Hat. Let's add you to the stream here. Oh, what's going on here? Do 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 do. There we go. Okay, so Scott P seventy nine says German Mausers the last over the last couple of years have gone crazy with their pricing. Yeah, I mean it's just like anything else. If you start to see double or triple the price, just you know. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next one then. So that takes care of the Mauser. Now we're going to go on to the uh, one of our favorites, the uh, M one Garand, and you can pronounce it M one Grand, M one Garand. Uh, Garand is what I've seen and what I've been told is a proper pronunciation on it. So the M1 Garand, all right, let me go ahead and just share a little bit of history with you real quick on this one. If you've never shot one before, if you don't have one, you need to get one. You can still get them. They're not hard to find, okay? Uh, the M1 Garand is a 30 6 caliber semi-automatic rifle that was the standard U.S. service rifle during World War II and the Korean War and also saw limited service during the Vietnam War. Most M1 rifles were issued to U.S. forces, though many hundreds of thousands were also provided as foreign aid to American allies. The uh, Garand, oh, get off the computer, ammo cat. There we go. She likes to jump up on the tower. The Garand is still used by drill teams and military honor guards. It was also widely used by civilians for hunting, target shooting, and as a military collectible. And I did uh, take one out and shoot, and it was it was awesome. I borrowed one from from Stan at an SS Pond, and it was a great rifle. Uh, the M1 rifle was named after its Canadian American designer, John Garand. It was the first standard issue semi automatic military rifle. By most accounts, the M1 rifle performed well. General George S. Patton called it the greatest battle implement ever devised. The M1 replaced the bolt action M1903 Springfield, which is coming up soon, people. Hang tight. As a standard U.S. service rifle in 1936 and was itself replaced by the Selective Fire M14 on March 26, 1958. All right, guys. Commentary on the uh, M1 Garand. What do you think? Is this the uh, Should this be the, the must-have Millsarp rifle for all of us on this panel, or are they overhyped? What do you guys think? Is this the, is this the one to get? Uh, I'm gonna step on a couple toes here, and I think uh -oh. it's a little overhyped. Uh oh, a little yeah. bit overhyped. Okay. And the I reason say, why, and here's here's my explanation for it is, you know, yes, it's a great system, but it's it's, it's ammo picky. You you have to either use the thirty out six surplus, or you have to, you know, go out of your way and look for something that's specifically designed for the M1 Garand. I know Privy Partisan makes it, but it's it's pretty difficult to you know go out and find off-the-shelf ammo for it um instead oh, of like american eagle first. makes the makes the um garand or grand mm -hmm. specific ammo yeah um, I, just, I just find it uh you know it's just find it strange that you know you you want to go out and get ammo for it and you know most of the people that say it's when they do get these, they either know what they have, or they just think, "Oh, it's a thirty out six. Let me put some of that, uh, you know, Winchester white box in it. Uh, go hunting with it, and they end up, you know, bending a rod or end up yeah. blowing up the gun." Now, but Squib, I, I did my, I did an ammo video on that specific ammo a long time ago, a couple of years ago, and people said, "Well, you can get an adjustable gas port for it that'll be able to handle the modern um, hunting ammunition." Is that a good idea? Is that a bad idea? Yeah, you can get the adjustable and then you can change it. I've ran really hot hunting ammo through my M1 Garand. Now, not a thousand rounds of it, but, you know, box of 20 here, box of 20 there. Never had an issue with it. I don't recommend it. That's not what it's designed for. But replicating the 147 or 150 grain full metal jacket load 
or the 163 to 168 grain armor piercing load is easy to do. There's tons of data out there on it. The old AP ammo that you really can't find anymore was some of the flattest, most accurate shooting ammo I've ran through my Garand. I miss the days where you could just go down to the, the gun show and buy this by the ton. But then all these people are like, it's armor piercing, it's armor piercing. And it's like, oh my goodness. All rifle armor is armor piercing. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, what? I'm, yeah, I'm telling of, you what. Yeah, I ran yeah. that stuff through an 03 Springfield and it shot flat. I'm like, this is some good stuff. And it was plentiful back. Then. So, you know, I didn't think, oh, I need to buy 10,000 rounds of this. So I've got it for the rest of my life. And then one day it just dried up because all these people bought it. And a lot of the dealers are telling me people are buying it because it was so cheap just to shoot, not because they wanted really accurate ammo or they wanted armor piercing capability. They just wanted cheap ammo to shoot. The thing is, um, Grand Ammo is readily available. It is a little pricey, but it's pricey because it's 30 out six. If you reload, it's not an issue. And yeah, you could put the adjustable gas block on there or whatnot. But if you're going to, you know, run a clip here or a clip there, and I didn't say magazine either, because with the Grand, you use a clip. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I haven't had any, any problem. And I mean, an op rod is not a cheap thing to buy, uh, but you know, that's, that's where your problem is going to be. You're going to bend your op rod. So, but parts are plentiful. Guns are, guns are expensive. They used to be cheap. I paid $450 for my Garand. I've had it 20 years. If I could only keep one gun, that is the gun I would keep. That does a lot of things. It does it really well. It doesn't do everything and it doesn't do it better than some, but I mean, if it was like, you can only have one gun, that is the gun I would keep. Um, so here's a question for you, Squid. Maybe you can answer this one. Calavera says, I've heard the Grand, the, I'm going to, well, let's call it the Grand. Okay. A Garand is a proper pronunciation. Anyway, was originally designed for 270 Winchester. Is that true? Was it originally supposed to be intended uh, for the 270? It was a, it was a, like 276 Henderson or some weird cartridge like yeah. that. Uh, that it, yeah. And, um, the M1 Garand that John Garand in invented <laughs> uh, was, uh, I think what they wanted to do was they wanted to just use standard ammo with that. They, you know, cause there were still a lot of O3 Springfields in inventory. And uh, what I heard was that uh, when World War II happened and they started getting these things out to the fleet and, and, and to the units out there, because it wasn't the, you know, even though, you know, people are like, well, they, they started making them in 36 in 1942. They weren't as readily available as most people would think. Standard issue for a lot of those units was just the uh, M2 armor piercing ammo. It was just, you know, flat out, not because they were like, oh, we're going to use this against tank or whatever. It was just like that was the standard thing that everybody got issued. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what I heard. I, I never read that. I just I've heard that, you know, just the talk around the the gun shows and stuff like that but um the the grand is even though it wasn't initially designed for the 30-06 back in those days they weren't even sure that they were really going to adopt a semi-auto rifle a lot of older military people in charge not just in america but all across the world were resistant to adopting a semi-auto rifle uh some comments here real quick yeah i mean it's it's a it's an amazing battle rifle there's so much fun to shoot um scott p79 says or you can just get an adjustable gas plug and you can shoot commercial ammo on the m1 garand okay I just um, hate how expensive they are nowadays you know you, you we're, find gonna, we're gonna go shopping i've got them on standby we're gonna we're gonna go shopping and see what a what a what a garand's gonna cost you now we got two options though but i'll get to that in a sec scott p79 says m1 garands are overpriced so that's something we can debate too can we still get them through the cmp the civilian marksmanship program are Garen still available? Yes. Last Maybe. time I looked, there's still some. There was some. Yeah, no, they're out there. Yeah, they okay. get back to them sometimes. You want to know why Garands are overpriced? It's because there was a time where you could go down to the gun show and you could pick one of these things up in service grade, not beat to crap. That would work just fine. You could have it for a lifetime for four or five hundred bucks all day long, just like buying the AP ammo, dirt cheap, all day long, right? And then one day... It just got out there that, hey, Millsurps. And suddenly all you guys went out there and bought up all the guns and bought up all the ammo and the prices went through the roof. Everybody decided suddenly, you know, they didn't care about them. And then overnight, it's like everybody wants to have a Millsurp. And these dealers were just rubbing their hands together going, we can make a killing. If you buy a Millsurp today for $400, next year it might be double the price. 
Now, you might say, well, that ain't right. That ain't fair. And I agree. That's kind of ridiculous. But the fact that you've got all these people running out and buying them because they get so much attention, even though they may not be there for the historical, they just go, I just want a cheap gun or, oh, this was in World War II. This sounds cool or, or whatever it is. So it, it is frustrating when you look at an M1 Garand and you see what it costs. And for me, knowing what I paid for mine, yeah, I, and then these things used to be dirt cheap. And just, they, I mean, tons of them. Now you got a dealer that, you know, oh, you, know you, you can't even trust them if they say they have matching numbers because it could be a, a fake. You know, people fake them to, to ra- rack up the, you know, jack up the price. So you've got to be very careful when you when you go to get one of these, especially if you're trying to get an M1C or M1D. Yeah. And so here we go. Uh, the, oh, go ahead, anyway. Go ahead. Go ahead. Another thing is, is be careful uh, if the price is too low. There's something there's something fishy about it. And I found myself in that situation. I was about to buy an M1 grand and then I was looking around and here it's from a company that's called federal ordinance. And they made grands off of their own receivers. And they were like these cast receivers that weren't heat treated properly. Mm. And they had like a bunch of them just like essentially detonate themselves and I mean, this one looked from the outside, it looked great. The action was all nice and smooth, but it was like 600 bucks. And I was like, this is, there, there's something wrong here. So I did some more research uh, before I went back and actually bought it. And here it's it's a, from a company that made essentially civilian, um, civilian repurposed ones or something like that using, they use like 03 Springfield barrels that were like turned down and then have like this, this like hokey kind of like barrel shroud. Oh, it was, the more you looked into these, these rifles, the worse it gets. So, so let's, let's just talk about it. What, what are we looking at for getting into one? Uh, buy it now. See, this is odd. I have it set to low to high for price. I'm seeing 1599 for a CMP uh, Korean war era. Garand. Uh, let's see. Try, now, try Fulton that? Armory. Fulton right, Armory is the right. only one that I know that still makes them brand new. Well, let, let's just show the high end. If you want to just right. not have to worry about it, here's an unissued M1D 30 out six Springfield M1 Garand 47.95. There you go. That will that will fix your problems right there, right? <laughs> Yeah, the M1D is going to have the M84 scope on it. This one, I don't think this one has an actual scope. It has the mount. Then it ain't worth that price. An M1D is going to have a scope mount, a scope, and a flash suppressor. And the scope, I believe those scopes are serialized to the rifle. Also. Yeah, this doesn't. Yeah, and the and the mounts are sco- are uh, serialized to the scope too. That's why I say be careful, careful about the the frauds because there will be people out there with reproductions and they'll they'll stencil them to make them match yeah. the rifle. Yeah. Okay, this one does. No, is that the scope? Is that the action? What is that? Okay, this one does have the scope. Um, so I would hope for four thousand seven hundred ninety five dollars, you're going to be getting the real deal. Oh, this has all the this has all the certified paperwork from the CMP though. Is that saying something, or is that not saying anything? That, I mean, that, that actually, at least it has some providence to it. That's, yeah, that's this is the actual delivery say. slip from CMP. You go to gun shows, you're going to see every other rifle is going to be sniper or ex-sniper and stuff. Go with somebody that knows what they're looking about, because people throw all that stuff around a lot. It used to be with Mossens, that was a big thing, was you know, ex-sniper, oh, yeah. ex-sniper. Sniper, X sniper, X sniper, yeah. everything was an X sniper or a sniper. Most of them were, were garbage, you know? <laughs> you got, the actual, like, the grand sniper, the actual numbers of those that are out there are very small, which you can probably tell by the price. So you definitely want, like, a paper, like you're saying, some kind of provenance to it, or mm-hmm. you want somebody that really knows what they're looking at to look at it, you know? Last time I looked at a sniper Garand, it was an M1C, matching serial numbers, mint condition. Uh, it was $3,600. It's about seven or eight years ago. $3,600, and the guy had the paperwork. The thing is, he could afford the paperwork, too. Now, uh, I could have put it on the credit card, but I'm like, eh, no, because I, I if I'm going to, I would probably take a regular M1 and put reproduction parts on there and use it as a daily shooter. This thing is a collector's item if this is legit. Yeah. You know, but 
ba- I remember back in the day, you could pick up C's and D's that weren't necessarily forgeries because they were plentiful and cheap once again. And that's when I should have bought one. Then it could have been my daily shooter and I wouldn't feel bad about it, <laughs> you know, ruining so the I, value. The lesson here is that <laughs> if you see a gun and you like it, just buy it because there's a chance it ain't going to be there tomorrow and it ain't going to be that price, right? That's that's not some moral of the story from today's episode, right? <laughs> But well, you, 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 you can look at the condition of one gun and it's beat to crap and you might go, it ain't worth nothing, but there might be a reason that it's beat to crap and that might actually hold a little bit more collector value. Maybe not now, but later on down the road. And then you got another one that looks mint condition. You're like, that's the one I want. And then come to find out it's not original. It's Arsenal refinish multiple times or it, they put a commercial barrel on it or something. It's it's really weird how some of this stuff, depending on what you're doing with it, most people I think you're trying to reach are just looking at this as a shooter. They just want a shooter. So it, it's just going to be a whole different thing. There are tons of books out there that you can buy and do your research. They've got pictures. They've, they, they've got, you know, all, where to look for the markings and the numbers and the rarities and this. And that. You can take these with you to the show. But here's another thing about those books. It's in stock in Amazon today, and in four years from now, you go to look it up, and it's unavailable or only available used. It's weird. Yeah. The books on the mill serps dry up like the mill serps do. Yeah. Luckily, with like things like eBay and stuff, you can still source them. And if you go to Tulsa, they have one one person has tables and tables of of, of gun books. That's all the person brought with them. So hey, you know, there's another reason to go to Tulsa. Somebody, somebody waiting to get in down there. Oh, and I think we're all here. Okay. Calibers, the, the M1 Grand. What's your Calibers? Let me know. Yeah. The M1 Grand is another one of those. I don't get why somebody isn't selling these for $500. Literally reproducing them with modern metals and everything else and replicating them so that every single part is interchangeable with an original Grand. Just stamp it with your, your company logo or something so people know it's, it's a reproduction part. But it's a real, it's not as cheap, garbage, whatever. And just cranking these things out because you would sell them as fast as you could make them. If $500 Garands were available. There'd be people out there buying multiples and this, that, and the other. Same thing with Lugers. I say this all the time about Lugers, why they don't replicate Lugers and just sell them. And I don't want to hear this stuff about you can't reproduce a metallurgy or we don't have any examples. There's tons of stuff out there that you can reverse engineer. Fulton Armory charges what they charge for an M1 Garand because they know they're the only game in town and people will pay that. And they don't have yeah. to worry about making them in, in volume. I'm looking at Fulton Armory right now. and The buy-in on a Fulton Armory M1 Garand is $2,300. Yep, and they, and they go up from there, so they're not. And, and, and I think, I, um, go ahead. E- well, no, even though these things use you know some good quality steel, and there's machining and heat treating and stuff like that. If you make these things on mass, you could still sell them for five hundred dollars each. You know, seven hundred fifty tops, but you could sell and still make a profit. But you've got to get that person who wants to invest in it, or the the gun company that already has the factory and the infrastructure and the heat treating and everything else, mm-hmm. and just go. All right, we'll tool up for this. But, you know, maybe there's some exec out there that says, no, this ain't worth it because we'll put all this money into it. And in two years, people will lose interest. I don't know. Lugers and Garands are two guns that people want to be able to use as a daily shooter to take to the range, have fun with. Mm -hmm. But they don't want to ruin the value of their collector item or they, they look at the price at the gun show and they go, I'll never own one of these. And I get it. I absolutely get it. What was I saying here? Um, this is an interesting comment. Scott P79 says, um, even the CMP is not cheap anymore because I believe it was Bush Sr. that changed them from being nonprofit to being a profit-based organization. So that could explain why the prices on their on the rifles for the CMP had gone up. I just, I just think it's a supply and demand issue that they just know they can get more for it. But like you said, Squib, I mean, every, every one of us, those of us that don't have an M1, that don't have $1,500 or $2,000 just sitting around to buy one, could be offered one for 500 bucks. Oh God. Yeah. Everybody would just to have one, everybody, you wouldn't even need one or want one. And you just buy Pretty one much. anyway. You know, I mean, you don't, you don't need, you don't have to have a need to buy a gun, but I'm just saying that, I, you know, it's just like if, if Mosins would go back into production and they'd sell them for 200 bucks, you know, for a brand new one, yep. you know, and, and see the full armory to me, to me, the full armory option is a good option because I know I'm not going to worry about any issues at all that might pop up on a, on an older rifle or something that's going to have headspace issues or whatever. I mean, I guess if I was going to get one, I'd probably go that route if I just want one to shoot for the rest of my life and I don't have to worry about it or worry about having an antique that I, uh, that I don't want to go take to the range, you know? The, so, the M1 Garand is like my Lamette. I bought them both at a time where they were $1,000 less than what they are today. 
And I can tell you that they're not worth that. But if you really want one, you really, you're going to pay it. There's just no way out. There's nobody else making the reproduction Lamat, so there's no c- competition there. Your uh, only other option with the M1 Grand is a Fulton Armory, and th- th- at that price, you might as well just get a Milser. And for some people, that price is a, it, it, it's a sting, and they're just not willing to, to you know, get stung like that. And I get that. There are a lot of people out there that have a $200 limit on guns. They do, any gun over their $200 is expensive to them. Other people have a $500. Other people have $750. Other people have $1,000, $1,500. Some people out there, $5,000 for a gun doesn't mean anything to them. So don't think I don't understand. My limit's right around a grand. After $1,000, I have to rub my head and question, do I really want this thing? Is it really worth it to me? And for other people, they may go, that's just too expensive. Well, we all have our different economic whatever. So with Milserps, it's a little bit weird because there was a day where you could just go out and buy. You could buy Mosins for $99 all day long. And for somebody who's used to doing that, being told you've got to pay four or five hundred dollars for a Mosin about make them sick. You know what I mean? So now let's talk about the M14. <laughs> let's just let's just segue into the M14. So I'm looking at these over on uh, Fulton Armory. And again, you're buying on on a new manufacturer, I guess you could call it, or however they do these after parts kits or whatnot. Twenty seven ninety nine will get you into a basic service model. $2,800 basically. This Scout is nice. I'd love to have one of these. That'd be cool. $2,899 and then they go up to basically $4,000. So what about the M14? Is this basically the same situation with the M1? Squib, what do you think? Or anybody else on the panel? Anybody else have an M14? I'd buy at a some, at, Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say at some point I wouldn't mind getting an M1A that's a semi-auto civilian M14. Yeah. Whereas the M14 is, is select fire and I really don't want to deal with all the paperwork and garbage yeah. for that, especially for something that even though I've never shot an M14, uh, I've heard that they're kind of uncontrollable and all that uh, on, on full auto. Um, the, the thing about that is you've got your, that's your, you know, 762 by 51 semi-auto. And for some people, that's kind of like the Holy grail people, people like that, that action. They like that caliber. But look at the price, man. Look at the price. Yeah, buying bidding on an M1A standard, the lo- least expensive one over on Gunbroke, if you want to bid, is nine hundred and sixty dollars, and then they go up from there. Thirteen forty nine if you want to buy a new M1A. Well, yeah, I guess you can always go through Springfield and buy a new one. I mean, I don't encourage people to buy guns from Springfield now because of what they did to the people in Illinois. But yep. um, if you want one, I'm just saying, you know, they're and the Fulton Armory ones are about a thousand dollars more. But yeah, fourteen hundred dollars, thirteen thirty is pretty much the buy in. So before I would buy an M fourteen or an M one A, which I'd honestly never buy an M one A just for that sole reason what they did to the to their own people. Uh, I'd buy a DSA FAL. So Yes, I absolutely hundred and ten percent concur. That brand and that model. Yes, I would get a FAL from DSA. Yeah, I, and, and those are not cheap either. Since I don't Dang. have it on the list, let's let's just go right to the DSA FAL. Okay, I'm not going to really get into the history of it because a lot of us know about the the FAL design and stuff and, and what they what they've turned into. But so okay, we just want to get one. Here's the uh, the Range Ready series SA58. Does that sound like a nice uh, nice one to start off with? Here we go. I wanted to get the Hebrew Hammer. <laughs> Wait, is that one that's made by DSA? Yeah, it's a limited edition. It was uh, what was it? AWAG, their receiver with all Israeli parts, right? I believe so. Yeah, they use the um, the Israeli FALs that either use the light barrel or they do have heavy barrel contours. Um, and I would prefer the the lighter barrel just for the simple fact that it's lighter. <laughs> I don't know if this is it, but I've got this guy right here. The DSA Israeli FL Light Barrel 308 762. Is this it right I'll here? I'll take it. Ah, I'll there you go. It. The well, Israeli FL. Jeez. $5,000. <laughs> I'm going to clap because it's like, oh, my God. i got to take out a loan to buy this thing. Us poors. All right. Yeah. So this is your Hebrew. Well, why, don't, why don't you go on the, the DSA's website? Because they actually have their rifles on their I website. I think I, I was actually just there, but I don't think that they have that particular model for sale, though. The, the D, yeah, I'm looking at it right now. The DSA 21 uh, inch Israeli light barrel officer grade Hebrew, Hebrew war hammer. So that's so it. That's it. That's the one. What series is it under? 
Um, it's under their, let's see, I think it's their classic series. Okay. SA 58 classic series. All right. So let, let's find this, this Hebrew hammer and see what the, uh, here you go. Israeli live barrel, Hebrew hammer, forge receiver, chrome line barrel. There you go. Okay. So notify me when available. I have no idea what they were getting for this. So Squib, what is it about this model that intrigues you? I what like the that? fact that it's an American made receiver. DSA does a really good job. Uh, I, I've got DSA parts and a DSA uh, upper uh, for uh, uh, AR-15s, and they do a really good job. They're all American-made, uh, and and the fact that they're going to take these Milser parts, kind of like how they do with some of the um, some some of the other Milser type rifles or commercial copies of Mil Milser rifles Mostly that have been, you know. You know, they, 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 they make the receiver over here. It's got to be 922R compliant or whatever it is. So you've got some history there on the gun, but it's still made in USA, quality control in the USA. And that's not to knock the Israeli quality control or any of that. I'm just saying that, you know, getting an original, it might be a little bit more difficult. Not to mention this one, even though they're pricey, you can go out and shoot it and not feel like you're destroying a collector's item because some of that stuff was made over here. And uh, I got to I got to handle one at the NRA show and talk to the guys at DSA. And I said, you know, I, I bought your stuff for AR-15s and I'm not disappointed. And they said, well, you won't be disappointed with any of our FALs. So they're using. So, so explain this to surplus you. Surplus parts. Surplus, surplus parts. Okay, I'm trying to so American made receiver, American made barrel. It's uh, yeah. I can't remember. Was it or uh, some of the barrel. some of the Israeli parts kits that were sold on Apex Gun Parts actually came with their original barrels. That's very rare nowadays because of uh, import bans on parts kits. Uh, but it's just like building an AK. You got to use the U.S. made receiver. You got to use the U.S. made barrel. You got to just make sure everything's all 922R compliant, and you're essentially good to go. It's pretty cool, man. The rifles assembled using the best overall condition original Israeli light barrel parts kits that we have. And these are all pre-89 import parts kits is what it says. Using these part kits, along with top quality DSA parts, we've recreated one of the rare styles of FAL rifles ever produced. The Israeli light barrel pattern FAL. Who, okay, who else makes, uh, There's isn't there another company that does FALs? There's one other company, isn't there? What's... Mm. In America? Yeah, I thought there is. D is D oh, DSA must be the one. Because I'm trying to think, if you want to buy one, if somebody just wants to buy one as a shooter, they've got oh. they've got a uh, cheaper version. Uh, I can't remember. Didn't Brownells do a video on it where it's just got really basic sights and really basic? I mean, it's it's your economy entry level. Yeah. Uh, FAL. I just can't remember the model number. Here's okay. So here's the traditional profile barrel. This is just their classic edition carbine rifle. Unfortunately, I don't have the price on this one. What do you think? We're we're just taking a guess. Or fifteen hundred, two thousand. I'm going to see their. Their, their classic one with the 21 inch barrel is around 1700. So okay, okay, 15 okay. inches is probably around that price range. That's, dude, that's, that's, I'm sorry, that's just a sexy looking rifle. I'm just going to say it right Absolutely. now. That is. That yeah, is, I was just going to say yeah, that looks that like is, a whole bunch of fun. That handle guard and the bipod. God. It, I don't know what it is, man. It's just, it's just a very cool design, you know? And I like the shorter dude. barrel on it. Yep. Dude, it just looks like a whole bunch of fun. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Pretty much, pretty much. And and you'll find FALs at gun shows and the different variants of them because there's all these different, you know, countries made their own stuff. I kind of like the anything with the wood furniture on there. That looks kind of cool. And, you know, you can get original, you can get reproduction or whatnot. There's, there's so many different variations. This is where these books come in handy. Mm -hmm. so you know what you're looking at and you know if you're getting a good deal or it's say you just want this you want this one made in this car caliber with this barrel length with this option from this country from this time period you know what to look for and you know that's where the collecting comes in with the mill serps so i'm probably not reaching the right audience with with my angle on it okay so we head over to atlantic farms at least we can get some prices okay here we go the sa-58 cold warrior rifle 1274 for a DSA, that's not bad. Okay, it's sold out, of course, but at least it gives us an idea about the ballpark figures on these things. Uh, what else we got here? Oh, yeah, here we go. Ooh, the pistol with the $14.99. Dude, I've brought one of those Wait, so Oh, there you go. Now that, that's your ultimate Wait truck right there. It, there it's go. a 7.62 by 51 NATO pistol? Yeah, limited yeah. barrel, dude. Oh, dude, that's got to hurt. No. We talk about throw a giant fireball, man. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm just thinking about girl. my old man arthritis. Ouch. Oh, come on now. Wouldn't this look nice to meet this year? Look at that. Look at that. There you go. That's your ultimate truck gun right now. I'm just going to say it right now. You're probably going to lose some ballistic efficiency with that short of a barrel. But God, that would just be fun. Does it come with a bottle of Excedrin? Ouch. There you go. Oh, this, come on, it's man. You're just going to shoot that from the hip. That'll fit perfectly in your tennis racket bag. I right used there. to shoot my M60 one-handed. And it wasn't hard to do, but it had all that weight to it. You know what I'm saying? This ain't going to have no weight to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's got a little bit of mass. I mean, the thing is, what, solid steel and aluminum? I mean, it's, you know. Yeah, look at that. Oh, dude, that would just be sweet. So in stock options, you can, so, so $14.99 on that. What else do we have? They make some wicked variants. Ooh, here you go, quad rail. Ooh, wick, pistol. There you go. There's that extra weight that you need right there for your arthritis squib. Here you go, man. Quad rail. That's that's some serious Call of Duty looking stuff right there. I'm sorry. There's no other way to say it. That is just. Uh, what do you guys think of that one? I'd rock it. I totally rock it. I mean, it's not. It's not okay. So it's not, we're kind of strained from the Millsurp idea, but it's still a Millsurp possibly receiver or Millsurp yeah. design originally. So that's kind of. Now we're just having some fun. Now so do you just, see what happens? A company reproduces a Millsurp gun and then they make variations on it so if you want to go in and you want to get the stock military issue blah 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 you can get that but if you want to get a higher end one or something they never made but dang it would have been cool if they did they can make that on the same tooling at the same factory and they can they can do the best of both this is how a company can make an all-american product have it sold out all the time, make their money, make it worth the time to invest in, in the reverse engineering and the tooling and everything else like that. DSA and other companies like that have, have become successful because they've done what I'm always complaining about. Now, if we could just get more companies on board and go, oh, we're not going to hire a marketing firm. We're just going to go to gun shows and ask people what they want. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I know. If they would actually go to the community instead of what they think is going to sell on the pages of Guns and Ammo magazine. And here's the thing. You can sit there and say, oh, why would they ever make a new Mosin? Nobody's going to buy it. Well, look, every single one of these is sold out. Don't tell me that people don't want these. When you can't get one, obviously there's a demand, you know, and don't, I mean, maybe you can contact, you know, because DSA's website says, you know, con dealers contact us for pricing because they want to go through the dealer to sell it. So, but I mean, I, I can't actually find one that's in stock. So, there is a, a solid argument that there is still a strong demand for modern production and or American made Millsurp firearms. I mean, if somebody wanted to, oh, here we go. We have one in stock. Okay, AY, go get your money. Uh, 1779 with Just a, use a credit card. Yeah, there you go. There you go. No. You have to, have to pay it off. It's in stock, 11 inch barrel pistol, adjustable gas port. There you go. That's it right there. There you go. Look at that. Now, isn't that just cool? Yeah. And I, I, uh, Sarah coat on the side, uh, clear the range, and I put a big old single chamber muzzle brake on it. Have like a warning this fire produces muzzle flash with like an arrow pointing forward. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to have engraving like that on a, for these AR pistols. Dude, the muzzle flash is so much fun on them, it, and it shows up great on camera too. But and if you put a huge single chamber brake on that, it'll just like it'll make everybody at the range angry. Well, that's your own problem. You know what? If you yeah, don't, I will like you very much and not, not want to deal with the noise, don't go to a gun range. I'm sorry. Go do something else. You'll Quick be like the 300 win man attack. guy. No thanks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, I have that 300 win man guy. <sighs> okay, so we're going to bring it back, guys. We're going to move on to my next favorite. And these, you can still get a good deal on them if you look around. The M1903 Springfield. Oh, man. All right, so real quick on this one. This is formerly the United States Rifle Caliber 30 out 6 Model 1903. It's an American five-round magazine fed bolt-action service repeating rifle used primarily during the first half of the 20th century. M1903, I mean, they're wicked competition rifles. What do you guys think about this? Thoughts, feelings? M1903 Springfield. Should it's, we get one? It's the American Mauser 98. That's I was all just going to say that. Is that what we would? Yeah. In yeah. fact, the action is even loosely based on it, if I'm not mistaken. It, it, it is. It is. It it's, is a Mauser 98 uh -huh. chambered in an American round with American sights and American stock. Does it now, have that's not me criticizing it. That's not. Idiots. That's okay. Okay. The Mauser 98 action is so good, so well made. That it was worth copying, and now you know I've heard stuff about patent infringements and lawsuits, and I, I don't know if any of that's really true or not. I've shot an O3, and it is absolutely awesome. But the thing is, for the price, and you just want a bolt action with that style kind of 
a Mauser might be a Mauser type rifle, or I mean, a, a surplus Mauser rifle, I should say, from Europe, might be a more affordable way to go. But thirty out six, yeah, you've got more variety in ammo than eight millimeter Mauser. Eh, they're not cheap. Well, let's go find one. Let's do some. I'm, I'm having fun shopping today. So, all right. So, let's go over to uh, again. We're just going to go to Gun Broker because it's the easiest place. Okay. To find one. While you're doing that, I want to put out a disclaimer. Uh-huh. There might be some O3s out there that have a low serial number. This is where these books come in handy again. Prior to some date in the teens or 20s, the receivers were not properly heat treated, and they can, with modern ammunition for sure, explode, break, whatever. Now, as far as I know, all of those were removed from inventory, but there could be one out there. This is not a gun you want to shoot because it's not safe to shoot. However, it would have collector's value if it really is a pre whatever the cutoff number was gun, not as a shooter, but as a collector's piece because so many of them were removed from inventory. Yeah. And so was- you want to know about that before you buy one, especially if you're spending thousands. There's there's there was actually one of them at one of my local gun shops and they they I'm glad they did their research on that and they actually gave the breakdown that's like hey this is a wall hanger do not shoot this you know this is uh, one of the lower number serial number runs that had the improperly heat treated receivers. Oh, these and if you're just, a collector oh and you God. wanted like one of each model, this is the original model O3. It's not like a 03A3 or 03A4 or anything like that. But if you wanted to complete your collection, you'd want one of these. And that's where if you come across one or you have one or you inherit one or whatever, you can sell it for a fairly decent price to the right collector. Here's the thing, guys. I was looking at these maybe two years ago with Night Strike on an episode of Caliber Corner. Seven, eight hundred dollars. Right. Look at this. Now, granted, OK, it's gun broker pricing. We can argue that. Fifteen hundred, eighteen hundred, twenty two fifty. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Sporter yeah. model. Somebody's asking $3,000, a custom engraved sporter. Find a, find a 03A3 sniper with all original stuff. <laughs> yeah. Ouch. <laughs> if you can, they're not even popping up on here. So I don't, oh, here you go. 03A32 grooves. 1850 on this one. Oh, it doesn't say sniper though. Is the 03A3 a sniper or, model or, or the, not? Uh, or the 03A3 as a sniper might have been the 03A4 or something like that. But regardless, okay, okay. I think it used the uh, M82 scope. Does that sound right, AWAG? Um, I wanted, sounds about right. Yeah, I think they used the M82 scope. And there was two variants on that. And uh, I think really that's about is it like a hand pick rifle and uh, just an off-the-shelf commercial scope. And that was your sniper variant. Hmm. So you could reproduce it. So you got to watch out for fakes. Here you go. Here you go. Okay. All right. Model 1903 sniper rifle. Starting bid. Good grief. $6,000. Told you. So go sell your car. <laughs> I'm, and I'm not complaining. I'm just saying it just it just shows you that if you want a mill serve, just go buy one. But here's I mean, the thing, though. Yeah, you yeah. could you could be Private Jackson from Saving Private Ryan, right? You know, yep. you get me within a mile of Adolf Hitler, boys, war's over because <laughs> that rifle will shoot. <laughs> oh, I was looking at the effective <laughs> range on this, and it's unbelievable what I was seeing off the. I mean, it was was I hearing? I don't, I don't know what what what's the max meters on this thing? What's the max effective range on I this mean, thing? I'm thinking with a scope and some training and the right ammunition, you're you're going to reach out to a 2,000 yard target. I'm not saying that would be your standard. See, I, was, I think it I was seeing 50, 50. How many meters is that? 2,000, 3,000 meters. I, I'm right. not saying it's impossible, but with the original scope, yeah. with the original scope, it's going to be limited by that because it wasn't yeah, a yeah. high powered scope like what you see on a modern sniper rifle or modern hunting rifle. It was a commercial off the shelf. Uh, scope. I want to say it was like a Redfield or this Lyman is, uh, or Warner something and like Swayze. that. Or... Warner and Swayze is what this one says. Oh wow! But that still, I mean, with the with the you're going to put you're not going to give this to your average grunt. You're going to give this to the guy that did the best in marksmanship training, and he's going to be your sniper. And he's he's you know he he might be doing accurate shots at two, three, four hundred meters with this thing, but he might also be reaching out there and getting that that really 
far away shot. That thirty out of six round will cruise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Most of your modern sniper rifles don't even use uh, magnifications higher than. I think the U.S. uses the highest magnification for their sniper rifles, which is a, a fixed ten power. You know, nowadays they're using modern optics like your Schmidt and Better PN2s, that kind of stuff. They go up to like twenty five power, but most of your modern militaries don't even go over four power scopes. Um, you know, but uh, to answer your question, seventeen hundred and fifty yards is one mile. So, okay. Ooh, man, looking at the comments, uh, Drusifer says, what is that, a trumpet? Yeah, that's the optic that they put on the top of it back in the day. So Caroline that's EDC Review though. says, uh, when I was JROTC in high school, we would use those for drilling. They were heavy and see many kids get hit in the head with those during competition. <laughs> oh, damn. Yep, yep. Oh, man, that's a cool one. Okay, so now we're going to kind of limit the discussion on this one because we've had talks about this next gun before. I'm not even going to show it off. The Mosin-Nagant, okay? So mosin Nagants. all right. So if you want one, is there somebody waiting in the lobby, though? Black Hat's out there. I'm going to bring Black Hat back in here. Um, most of the guns, I did pick one up at a gun show. Non-numbers matching. Beat up. Beautiful. 1943. War patina. It cleaned up good, by the way, for 200 bucks. Um, otherwise, you're looking at 350 to 379 on Gun Broker. 350 to 400 when they pop up on Classic. So I would honestly say, I mean, depending if you want one or not, they're awesome and they're cool, but I kind of wish my money had had rather gone towards something else like say an M1 or an M1A or just because the Mosins are so common. I mean, they're, they're not rare. The prices on them are high. Um, the two that I have, they're great. The ammunition's cheap. They're fun to shoot. They're loud. They, they kick good. It gives you a feeling of what people had to lug with them through combat. Just a basic idea. You know, you put your bayonet on there, the thing's like six feet long, you know, they are a blast. They are, they are a lot of fun to shoot. If you don't have a Mosin Nagant, Try to snag one for, say, $200 at a gun show if you can get one. Um, but otherwise, you're going to expect to spend $375 or $400. And if you want it as a hunting rifle, you're like, well, I can buy it and use it for hunting, and it's a mill serp. Men and a man accuracy is not unheard of in those things, especially if the bore is really well worn out on it, even if it's been countered. Well, you don't know how accurate it's going to be. I mean, yeah. you're, 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 you're right, but you're, 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 you're wrong. Um, yeah. When it comes to the Mosin accuracy, what people – they, they always say, oh, these, these rifles suck. They don't hit anything. And my, I, I've had multiple Mosins. I've, I could count on two, both of my hands how many I've had. You know, uh, all of them using good ammunition will shoot just as good as any of your other rifles. In all honesty, if you're using surplus ammo, that's all the surplus ammo nowadays that's out there is all machine gun ammo it's made to be a high pressure round to cycle the action of a pkm your pks those kinds of guns you know and they're they're just mass produced ammo for the machine guns because machine guns are accuracy through volume Mm -hmm. whereas the mosin is accuracy through actual accuracy so with good ammo like the ppu your PPU 150 grain, uh, either soft points or full metal jackets, you can get inch groups at 100 yards with a Mosin if you do your part. The, and another thing is that people always complain about the accuracy of the Mosin. It's because they're, they don't tighten down the action screws as much. They, they take it all apart to clean it, and they put it back together, and they don't tighten down the, the action screws enough, and that will create slop in, in everything, and the more slop you have, the less consistent the rifle will be. Yeah. Yeah, and again, you're right. A lot of it does have to do with the shooter. And I, and I think that's maybe why sometimes it gets a bad rap because somebody's not putting really the time. They're taking it out to the range. They're putting 20-round box through it. Oh, it's a six-inch group, or oh, it's all over the place. I mean, you really got to know the rifle. You really got to learn the rifle to shoot it well. And I think a lot of people just go in there maybe because they want to bash the Mosin for what it is. Um, what is the what is the nickname for it? The garbage rod is yeah, it? the garbage. You know, <laughs> I remember. Because, first... I mean, they did kill a lot of Nazis, regardless of what you think. You know, mm-hmm. they yep. killed a lot of people all over the globe in lots of yeah. different conflicts. I remember the first time I had an opportunity to buy a mo. Oh, I shouldn't say I had an opportunity. The first time I even gave it a serious thought because I'm like, I don't want one of them commie guns. When I bought my M48, my M1 Garand, the guy gave me a deal because I bought both of them, and he goes, Hey. You want to walk away with the third one? I'll give you a deal on that. And 
He's got a crate of Mosin snipers bathed in Cosmoline. Dozen of these things in a box, right? And I'm like, nah, because you could get them all day long, right? And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't want that yeah. commie rifle. I don't want that commie scope. Now I'm there going, oh, man, an original Mosin with a PU scope. And if, I know that this ain't going to be a fake. There was no way he had 12 fakes, right? And at the time, they were shipping over crates and crates of these things. So they were pretty common at the gun shows. And I could have picked that one up and got a deal on all three. And I kicked myself. to do, But at the time, I wasn't interested in that. I didn't want any of that. And I didn't. And for me now, the collector value is I'll never get a chance on that again. I, you know, and, you know, do I get the reproduction stuff, stuff and make yeah. my own or uh, yeah. I, I really want that M28. And you looked that up on a previous episode of Caliber Corner. I want to say you said it was like six or eight hundred dollars on Gunbroker. And that's that's the Mosin I want to get next for my collection is that M28. Mm -hmm. So looking at these, your, your finished captures are going to cost you about six fifty. dollars What's claimed to be an authentic Russian scope is around $2,200 right now. Yep. Uh, hey, we can buy a crate of twenty dollars for $6,000 over on Gun Broker. $2,200 for a PU yep. scope? Yep. Yep. yep for for an an oh, yeah. my goodness. Yeah, this stuff is just completely blowing my mind. Now, this is really bothering me because I'm seeing starting bids in the upper 400s now, whereas yeah. – like a year ago, 379, 350 was not okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go take it all the way down as as far as I can to the low price to see just what what an entry level Mosin's gonna. So I felt good about getting a non numbers matching. Just so get like a Tula round dollars. receiver arsenal refinish. Okay, so we're yeah. gonna look. I'm gonna look at the buy. Okay, so starting bids on a lot of these are 300. Let's go to buy it now because I'm just really. If somebody just wanted a Mosin, like, you know what? These clowns keep talking about Mosins. I just want to go buy one. What's it gonna cost me to get into one? Uh, so the deal three, with 399 is now the starting price on a Mosin Nagant at Gun Broker. All right, 399 <laughs> to buy it now. To buy it now, 400 dollars. Mosins have basically hit the 400 dollar marker now. And Arsenal refinish. Okay, now Arsenal refinish never fired. Okay, so that 1942 Tula. If I was going to buy one and this one looked clean, this would probably be the way that I would go. Now Arsenal refinish could mean that it's been counterboard. I don't know why they say never fired. I'm not sure how they pull that off with that uh, with that kind of. Uh, That's a lie. There's no such thing as an unfired Mosin. I want to see what they, yeah, I mean, how, what's their, did it have a new barrel put on it? What's, what's the claim on this one? This is an as received from the importer 1942 round receiver Mosin Nagant 9130. Oh, oh, I have never fired it. Dude, come on. Don't put that in the description box. Yeah. Good God, man, that's total clickbait. The bore is bright, the stock has no cracks, and the parts stamps match, number 719. The arsenal siding mark on the front sight remains untouched. It's a clean rifle with very little cosmoline. Okay, so I mean, aside from what he says about never being fired, maybe he's saying that you're buying it at your own risk at the same time. Never fired, technically. Um, this, you know, this this is this is doable. I'd like to see into that receiver and make sure it's not pitted. But, uh, I mean, this is pretty typical. Now, at the gun show last spring in Lincoln, Nebraska... 350 would get you a Mosin that you could look at, that you could handle, that you could run the action on, that you could inspect. So you still can probably get them at your gun shows for $350. I mean, the one that I got for 200, it was a dude that was selling six rifles on one table. He just so he said, look, you know, he goes, it's not perfect condition, but it's a shooter. You know, I've taken it out a couple times. It's non-numbers matching. And I and he threw it. And the funny part is the one that I bought, the guy gave me the bayonet. It was the wrong bayonet. He gave me one of the not the original bayonets, but the next run of bayonets, the pre-spring loaded bayonets. And those bayonets are two or three hundred dollars now. Mm -hmm. So I actually got one of the like the 1891 series bayonets. The first ones look like they were like oven baked or something. If you've ever seen the very original Mosin bayonets, they look like they were like <laughs> I can't even explain it. You gotta look them, but they look like they're like a cast iron, basically. So I got the next series that has um like a little ring or something on it that secures it. So I actually did pretty good on that purchase. But so yeah, we're looking at 400 for an entry level on a Mosin. If you don't have one and you want one just to have one, then just go ahead and get one. Um, you know, there's a billion variants. There's you can research your life looking these things up, yep. all the markings and the lineages and, and the different countries that produce them and something you could do to possibly get a Mosin for a better price is if there's if you're there to get an Enfield or a Mauser or I mean fill in the blank here. And you see something you really like and the guy's got a Mosin too. And you don't have a Mosin in your collection. You've got the cash on you. Try to make a deal. I'll take both of these. What are you? 
how much will you knock the Mosin down if I take both of these? Mm-hmm. When I go to the to the antique arms show, I bring a, a that that video I did with the shooting mat that folds up and that's a gun case. You can fit three Milsurf rifles in there. And when they see that I've got a case that'll take three rifles, they're suddenly going, this guy's serious. He wants, he wants a deal. And I've bought two and three guns before at, at different gun shows and had them knock 50 bucks or a hundred bucks off. Cause you know, especially on a Sunday, they just want to unload it. There's less stuff they got to load in their trailer and haul back. And now some guys won't budge. Some guys are just hardcore. I'll, I'll put this on the table for the next six months. I don't care. All right, dude, that's your, so Travis, maybe you're not looking for a Mosin and you don't want to pay those ridiculous prices. There's ways around it. What you want, Squid? Travis, go back a couple, go back a couple of uh, pictures where, oh, right there. See that line across the, the numbers there? That is mm-hmm. not a numbers matching part. So this, 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 this post is, is a lie. That's a Arsenal refinish. They took a part from another Mosin, and that's what they did is they just crossed out the old serial number that it actually belonged to and put the new one on there. So it says nice matching. <laughs> so yeah. like, here's the thing, guys. I mean, you uh, – I, 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 and I'm, I'm kind of frustrated because it's like somebody gets one, and they're going to spend the money, and they think they're getting – now, I'm going to tell you right now, four ninety nine is a pretty typical price for an M44 or an M38 because that's the shorter model. Those tend to bring more of a premium. They're a little more rare. Uh, so, I mean, that's not uncommon. I was seeing 450 on the M44s and M38s at the gun show last spring. So, I mean, but yeah, you really got to just take this description with a grain of salt, unless they're showing you every single serial number on every single part of this rifle, you know, the bolt, the receiver, the little floor plate on the magazine, uh, the butt stock, there's no guarantee it's going to be hundred percent numbers matching. So buy it with an open mind that you might be buying something that's not exactly what the person is saying. Yeah, I mean, uh, in 2014 or 15, I bought my first, my very first rifle, and that's my Mosin M44. I still have it. I bought that a little bit expensive. Um, it was covered in Cosmoline, and it was uh, one of the lower production years. 1947 was the lowest production year of the M44 style rifle, um, and I, I paid 400 bucks for it. I mean, at the time. I mean, that's a little expensive even nowadays, but it's such a clean example, and it's one of the more uncommon production years. Uh, I, I've had people offer me $800 for it. So, oh, wow. Yeah. And yeah, when you get into these, it, it could have been a special – it could have been, you know, for a particular unit it was issued, issued to. It might have been a, a low production number. You can go to 7.62x54r.net. And mm-hmm. you can basically look up the lineage of your specific Mosin and find out basically everything you need to know if it was anything special. You can type in what you know. You can select the options for your particular Mosin, and it'll tell you basically when it was produced, if it has any kind of special lineage about it. I'm going to say, let's just say right, with three, 75% of the time, you're going to find out that yours was just a standard troop issue rifle, which is perfectly fine. And if you really want to get into buying one of these as an investment, you know, look at buying one of the finished capture models or look at mm-hmm. buying an M44, you know, yep, or even so- an early, like a clean hex receiver. This guy wants 570 on this one. And this is just a PW Arms import. This is very similar to the one that I have. Um, I think mine's an, mine's an Izzy, but, or Tula. It's one, I think it's a Tula, actually. A while back, uh, I went to a gun show. I think it was a couple of years ago. I picked up a... Uh, finish capture M91. There's a difference between the M91 and the M9130. Um, it's just uh, this was the the older ones. This this was a hex receiver, but it was finish capture, and it had a different front sight on it. And I did some research here. It's an M91 Dragoon, and it's finish capture, and it has uh, you know a bunch of. It was captured twice. It was a, a Russian make. And then it was captured by the Finnish. Then it was captured back by the Russians. Then it was captured back by the Finnish. So this has been captured twice. <laughs> so I did all my research on it, and then I took it all apart, and I wanted to like look at it, see if I could find any more information about it. Here it has no import marks either. So I like I had this, and I was like, oh, this is great. And some I went to the range to, to shoot it, and some guy offered me a thousand bucks, and I was like, done. <laughs> So I took it to an FFL and I sold a, a five hundred dollar Mosin for a thousand bucks. 
That's crazy, man. So you had a double double capture model. <laughs> yeah, maybe he wanted that particular one to complete his collection. He's willing to pay it or something, you know? Yeah, I mean, I just bought it because I I saw it, it was a finished capture and had a different front side on. It had a blade front side on it instead of the uh, the standard post, and it had the um, the rear sight was marked in arshins instead of your meters, because that's what they did on the really early models. Arshins are not Correct. based on a unit of measurement. They're you. They're based on like uh, paces. It's weird. It's like X number of arshins is this many of paces, and it's it's strange. You're talking about the uh, the the side on the top, the original. Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah yeah. Oh, looks like Squibby got booted out there. Um, so here's okay. Here's the deal, guys. We're gonna make this a part two next week. We're gonna continue because there's a lot of guns we didn't get to talk about. And uh, unfortunately, I have family. Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, I have family showing up, so I have to end this discussion. But we are gonna just take a minute, and I do want to focus on uh, a caliber that sometimes gets uh, overlooked real quick. Okay, we're gonna talk about 22 short real quick, just to change the topic. So here, here's what you need to know about. 22 short and yes ammo is still out there it's still readily available 22 short's not going anywhere so 22 short is a variety of 22 caliber rimfire ammunition it was developed in 1857 for the first smith and wesson revolver the 22 rimfire was the first american metallic cartridge there you go the original loading was a 29 or 30 grain uh, bullet and four grains of black powder. The original 22 rimfire cartridge was renamed 22 short with the introduction of the 22 long rifle in 1871. Developed for self-defense, the modern 22 short, though still used in a few pocket pistols and mini revolvers, is mainly used as a quiet round for practice by the recreational shooter. Uh, 22 short was popularly used in shooting galleries at fairs and arcades. Man, they need to bring that back, guys. Several rifle markers or makers produce gallery models for, uh, for 22 short exclusively due to its low, low recoil and good inherent accuracy. The 22 short was used for the Olympic 25 meter rapid fire pistol event until 2004. And they were allowed in the shooting part of modern pentathlon competitions before they switched to air pistols. Do you guys have any experience with 22 short at all? Just a little. What do we know? I mean, you I can get. Them. What's that? I said I've shot them. Yeah, I've shot them too. I know you can, if you look, obviously, if you look at your rifles, you look on the bird, it'll tell you if, you, if it can handle or if it'll cycle properly 22 short or 22 LR. Uh, I've never purchased a, you know, a, a firearm made specifically for 22 short, but there was just somebody that was kind of curious about it. And so, yeah, kind of, a, it's like a, a light gaming application, I guess you could say, kind of a, a target practice application. Um, carnival fair caliber for games that you would play, shooting games you would play, even oh. quieter than a 22 long rifle. Yes. Um, what surprises me is the price of the ammunition. I'm a little bit shocked at the price of it. So, if we're looking at modern 22 short arms core, 50 rounds at two dollars and 69 cents. I guess that's not too bad. 50 rounds for three bucks for arms core Remington is going to cost you 2.99 for 50. Um, Agula is going to run you six cents around three bucks for a box of 50. I must have been mistakenly looking at the case prices. So what about, Hey, what about some kind of like a, like a, like a small varmint or small game application? Would this work or is this not going to be powerful enough? We're talking like, let's just talk like rat or raccoon or I don't know. What would you guys think? Rabbit squirrel. Would this be an adequate round for something like that? Or would there even be any kind of point behind using 22 short for hunting? Well, back during the 22 long rifle shortage there, 22 short was still available. Okay. And if you had a gun that could run 22 short and you wanted to plink, there was your option. But I don't think a lot of people were aware of that or they had guns that uh, just wouldn't take it. Like you said, look on the barrel and it'll say if it'll take 22 short, 22 long and 22 long rifle. So, like, here's an example. Here's a North American Arms little mini revolver. These are a lot of fun to play with. Uh, and this one's chambered in 22 short. Specifically, so just to kind of give you an idea. So, you might buy a gun that's not chambered for 22 LR or, you know, some of the semi-automatics, they might not be rated for 22 short, but they are rated for 22 long. I'm thinking of, like, what? There's a smaller one called six millimeter Flobert or Flobay or. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I've heard of that one too. Is that is that similar to twenty two short? It's a shorter twenty two short. How do you get any shorter than that? It's a captured twenty two short that's been shortened. 
Okay, so real quick, six, six millimeter floor board is basically a, is basically like a black powder percussion cap with a bullet stuck in it. <laughs> so it's kind of okay. So it says it's a cartridge consistent of a percussion cap with a bullet attached to the top. The yeah. cartridges do not contain any power, and the only propellant substance contained in the cartridge being the percussion cap. So how is this different from twenty two Calibri? Is twenty two Calibri just the primer with no yeah. actual projectile? Okay, so it's kind of the opposite. Okay, how do you run that down a barrel and not get a squib? No, no, twenty two Calibri. Oh, oh, the Flobert? It would be a super short barrel. Well, let's see here. Okay, it says in Europe the twenty two BB cap introduced in eighteen forty five, and the slightly more powerful twenty two CB cap introduced in eighteen eighty eight are both called six millimeter Flobert and are considered the same cartridge. The cartridges have a relatively low muzzle velocity, around seven hundred feet per second to eight hundred feet per second. So they do generate. It does that. That percussion does generate enough velocity. That it's going to run. It says they're they're made for what's called parlor guns for that cartridge, and it says because those rifles and pistols were designed for target shooting in homes with a dedicated shooting parlor or shooting gallery. So there are oh yeah there are pistols designed that can run it yeah. And here's here's an example of one right here. Here's a nineteen I don't know what year this is. Let's show this one off. So six millimeter Flober pistol together with its description in the nineteen twelve catalog of the manufacturer Francois de Arms Day whatever. Okay, so you can see an example just a single shot hammer fired. Flobert pistol. It says 40 centimeters. That I don't know if that's the barrel length or if that's the entire overall length of the gun. So they would have been small guns, but they do have a you know a okay sized barrel. So I don't think squib loads are going to be an issue on a squib. Just kind of looking at it, here's two six millimeter Flobert rifles. Huh. Oh, this is an interesting one. Oh wow. So here's <laughs> Nine millimeter Flobert shot, nine millimeter Flobert short, oh twenty two long rifle shot, twenty two LR, twenty two LR shot, twenty two CB short, and then nine millimeter Flobert BB cap. Dude, that's adorable. That is absolutely. That, I think a fun. That's like a happy family right there. That's that's America right there. There you go. That's America. That's a. <laughs> oh God, that is awesome. Anyway, just, I'm not. I'm just trying to laugh. I've never seen some of these rounds before. It's just amazing what you learn when you look this stuff up. It's pretty cool. Huh. So again, 22 short. You know, I mean, yeah. If you want something that's going to be relatively quiet, I don't know if you could run 22 short with a suppressor, and you'd have a. I don't know if they make like a subsonic 22 short round that you could that you are, with a suppressor. You could practically shoot it in your house if you had adequate ventilation. I was going to say I think all 22 short is subsonic. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I concur. Okay, okay. Yeah, so you I have to have everything. The, yeah, I used the six millimeter Flobe in it uh, through my Savage Mark II bolt action. I haven't had any issues with those, and okay. they're there. You could shoot them in your house. <laughs> Here now, we're not obviously we're not condoning any time. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that unless you have an adequate setup. The, the, the opinions and ideas expressed on the, pal the, the panel of Caliber Corner are just simply suggestions for amusement and entertainment. Please follow this advice at your own risk. So here's a 27 grain, 22 short that runs at 1,164 feet per second. Is that supersonic or not? What is supersonic for feet per second? Um, Isn't it above? It's, it's 1100. It's, How much? 1100 feet per second. It's 1150 technically. So this is barely now that's out of whatever factory barrel they fired that out of you know yeah. so you might be below that so you'd be 29 grain or is subsonic so yeah 11 yeah. feet per second is it depending on your altitude uh at sea level it's 1150 um anything less than that you're not going to get a, a sonic crack okay so anyway, that's kind of our little take on 22 short, and you can look up 22 short specific firearms if, you know, like I said, that little NAA revolver that's out there. Um, Calaveras says my Marlin 60 won't cycle shorts, uh, short yeah, rounds. No, no semi-auto is going to cycle shorts unless it's designed for short. Yeah. There's not enough move to move that. There's, there's the there's the market right there. Make yourself a uh, a super light bolt carrier group 22 short semi-auto. That would sell like hotcakes right there, or a handgun. If you want a really fun 22 short pistol, Beretta used to make one called the Minx, which was oh. basically a jet fire like your little pocket gun in 22 short. Dude, that'd be sweet. It's actually fun to shoot. I, I have a jet fire in 25 auto, but I always wanted to find a Minx. I could find one cheap enough because they are fun to shoot. I shot a Brett a few years ago. 
Uh, Calavera says twenty two short would work fine for rabbit. So there's there's an you know there's an idea right there. So yeah. It's kind of a fun little caliber. It's kind of neat to see what's out there. And if you, again, if you look for the specific farms, you should be able to find them. See, oh, sorry if I'm missing any comments, guys. Um, all right, we're going to go and call it. We'll do a part two to this conversation next week because we got to talk Arasaka. We got to talk Enfield, SKS, SVT40, PSL. Maybe do a little bit more on the M14 because we didn't give it enough. Uh, up justice maybe so we're going to make a part two out of this next saturday we'll pick another caliber i'll look and see if anybody else suggested another caliber to discuss uh towards the end of this discussion and um i think we're going to go ahead and call it there guys like i said i got family showing up here shortly we've got some stuff we're going to do today so anyway let's go ahead and let the uh, panel close it out so squib we're going to start off with you anything you want to say before we go thanks for the invite uh always love talking about mill serps mm -hmm. and everybody have a good weekend Right on, man. Right on. By the way, that coffee should be here any day now, just to let you know. Okay, right. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Cool, cool. All right, Black Cat, anything we say before we go? Uh, I'm having some internet issues. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, Travis. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for getting me out of the back room there. Calaveras was kind of petting me inappropriately back there. I wasn't, I was happy to get out of there. But, I'm not uh, saying nothing. I'm not saying uh, nothing. Go check out, uh, see it. What's that? Breaking up there, buddy. I'm walking up. Say, if you guys, yeah, just say, go. I think what Black Hat is saying is you should go out there and go bid on some of those high-end Springfield sniper rifles if you can. That's his advice to you this week. All right. Black Hat, we're losing you, buddy. You're breaking up. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, and move on. So, AWAG, thanks for joining us today and staying with us for the uh, duration of this podcast. Always appreciate yeah. having you here. Yep. Thanks for the invite. It's much appreciated. Okay. We'll talk uh, some more Millserp next week. We got to, and if we forgot anything, if you guys want to leave a comment on this video, those of you that are watching, if there's something you really want to hear us discuss and we didn't discuss it in this one, and it's not an Arasaka, an Enfield, an SKS, an SVT40, or a PSL, let us know and we can discuss it. We can also talk, you know, M16 and things like that too or whatnot. Um, okay, Defense Dad. Hey, yeah, thanks for the invite. You know, I wish okay. I was going to contribute it more, but I tell you one thing, I learned a lot, and it's got the woodworker side of me. It got me kind of the juices flowing because I, I love this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, like if you don't mind buying something rough, you know, refinishing stocks and stuff like that, that's, you know, man. Mac, I might have to commission you to uh, to refinish the stock on my other mows, and this is there's some temptation there. I know nothing about refinishing wood at all, so. Oh, gotcha. Cool, cool. All right, and guys, make sure you check out Defense Dad's channel. Um, otherwise, again, shout out to SS Pond for sponsoring uh, this episode of Caliber Corner. This has been episode number one hundred and thirty nine, and uh, shout out to Sandhill Shooter who was with us, Black Hat Outdoors, Calvers Thirty Two Special joined us. Did I forget anybody? Was that it? Aside from you guys that are here. Uh, we'll probably be back on the gun tube chamber uh, Saturday morning. Just so you guys know, I went with StreamYard. I thought we we're going to have some complications this morning, but it was actually me and it wasn't the system. So uh, that's why we just did this one through um, StreamYard today. So anyway, joining us today, we had tacos and French fries. Yoder, Texas says, I remember shooting a couple of those carnival rifles. That was years ago. I think they were semi-auto 22 shorts. Oh, huh, interesting. Okay. Tacos and French fries says, great show as usual. Thank you very much. Rich White says, get a 22 mare's leg. There you go. G23 is out there. Calaveras 32 special. Um, Uplift Mofo Party Plan says, make the, oh, they make the NAA pistols a half hour away from me. Cool, cool. Uh, Scott P79 joined us today. Hunan Muhammad 556 was out there too. Uh, let's see. Anybody new? Tacos and French fries. I mentioned you. I don't want to miss anyone. I know we had some Yoder Texas out there. You guys had a lot of discussion out there. Drucifer joined in today. Ozzy Orsborne joined in today, too. Avid Waterfowler was out there also. All right, man. Cool, cool. Avid, I think I sent you an invite. If I missed you, let me know. I will make sure that you get in next time. I'm pretty sure you're on the list. Uh, DM Foz was out there. Ronald Robertson chimed in for us today. Brian Cares out there, too. Patrick was watching. Uh, keep scanning here. Squibble is out there and over here. Fluffy 10 millimeter Jeep guy. Thanks for having. I like to have you over here on the show every week. Fluffy, thanks for watching, bud. And Justin Gibbons was watching. Daniel Pfeiffer and AWAG. So 
we're going to go and call it again, Caliber Corner episode number 139, where we had a little Milser rifle talk. I want to apologize in advance if this was an expensive episode for you and uh, you're now looking at Milser rifles and going to pick one up. Do it. They're great investments. Just really do your research before you buy. Not that it's a hopeless lost cause. If you want to buy something, just buy something, but just really understand that what you're getting might not be what the person says you're getting. Make sure you do your research and you're going to be all set. So in the meantime, guys, I want you to have fun. I want you to be safe. And as you know, as always, we will talk to you soon. Y'all take care and have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye, Alicia. Alicia, go to the store and get me a Mosin' a gun.